okay. If you're gonna if you're gonna tell tell people about what we did, then then we may as well start the episode. So here we are. Um, yeah, I did a podcast with you in, for your Brazilian podcast uh, called uh, I can't pronounce it Projeto Mayhem. Yeah, this in English would be the Mayhem Project. It's mayhem. based on a book. Uh, it's an old book, but you will probably be know know it better from that movie with Brad Pitt. I don't know. It might that movie might be called something else here. No, I believe the movie was oh Fight Club. Fight Club. <clears throat> yeah, I thought you were saying it was yeah Project Mayhem. That's where it's from, it, hey. It, it's older than the the movies because uh, it was from the, based on the books, and then the movie started, and and the project goes boom here. But it was kind of the, the wrong way we we wanted to go. <laughs> but it was really so, nice. It was. Wait, you, but are you saying that you based the podcast on the name from the book before the movie was made? Yeah, the podcast is based on a group of people that uh, used to reunite <clears throat> together before even the, the internet was a deal. Oh, wow. Uh, we began in Orkut. I, I don't believe really Orkut was known outside Brazil. The first, the first incarnation of this project, I believe it was a, a telnet group and then an email uh, group of people trying to discuss magic in the beginning of the internet. Wow. Wow. The, and... This podcast is a, is a new thing. Yes, uh, yeah. Because you started it with the pandemic. You started it be when you couldn't have, hold conferences anymore, right? You were doing conferences on Hermeticism and uh, Freemasonry and other things. Because you're a Mason, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. And Are we you... had this, this symposium that we used to hold every year. And we did about 10 meetings. And now with the pandemic, we couldn't make the 2020. Oh, so yeah. they said, oh, why don't you start interviewing people in the, the internet and making videos and etc. And I say, oh, man, I'm not a YouTuber. <laughs> but uh, there wasn't anyone who wanted to do that. So I, I did. Awesome. And we, yeah. we got to, to over uh, 190 people so far. Yeah, it's a big podcast. I saw Aaron and Carrie Leach each did an episode and Lon, Lon Milo Duquette did an episode. And so the English in ones. The, in, uh... the, in, in the beginning, we just interview Brazilian authors, yeah. and then they started. Oh, why don't you interview this and that author? But then there was a problem because here in Brazil um, we don't speak English, so we had to record it and then upload the video, and then we have to correct the subtitles from the YouTube. That is, they are really freaky. <laughs> And then we post the video and it worked. <laughs> so here we are. Here we are, yeah. All these companies are always like contacting me to produce transcripts of my podcast for me. And, and uh, you know, they'll like, here's, here's one transcript and we'll do one for every episode if you pay us this much money. And I look at the transcript and it, it's nonsense, especially with some of the words we use. But like, there's no human hand involved at all. They're just throwing it through Google Translate or something, I guess, like that, and then trying to sell it. Uh, it's, it's such a sham. Um, yeah, so it is a bit of work that you must go through to put Brazilian under my speaking when I was on your episode. Yeah, but it, it still worked, right? You, were, you said you were saying uh, you were surprised how many people watched it. Well, so was I. Yeah, but it was yeah. fun. Well, well, when we recorded that, we'd be usually about... 20, 30 people. Uh, when I, I record with someone with another language, and uh, it's even less. But then when we go to <clears> YouTube, uh, it's quite famous here. I would say famous, but uh, a thousand people is a lot of people in Brazil to study occult. And uh, here yeah. is a Catholic, uh, <clears throat> mostly neo-Pentecostal country. Yeah. And our president is, is tight, really tight to the church now. So we are having some satanic panic uh, all over oh, the really? country in the, the last year. So it has become uh, a little bit more hiding, let's say, the, these years. Is that, the occult also study not... and things like that are becoming secret societies again. Right, yeah, because, and I think that's a worry up here too. Um, 
<clears throat> I was talking to chatting back and forth with uh, my OTO Thelema buddy in San Francisco, Tim Bob, and we were talking about uh, EA quetting and stuff like that. And, you know, they really promote hurting people with magic. And there's even uh, like even even Solomonic magicians who do Goetia work like uh, John King. I just was I just read his Imperial Arts. They take claim for causing events that led to deaths. So there's a slight concern that, you know, some countries might make magic illegal again, which would be uh, strange, interesting and horrible because. Um, yeah, but if you encourage people to claim they've hurt others magically, I, I'm sure some countries will start to take some sort of action. It gives, you don't want to give the government extra excuses to... <laughs> to uh, well, in, in Brazil, it is illegal to, to threaten someone with magic. You can go oh, it to still jail. Is, yeah? Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, so... If you say, I'll, say I will, I will make a curse, I put a curse on you, and do something, um, even if it's related to mostly to African magic. Now, here in Brazil, it's very strong. The Umbanda, Candomblé, King Banda. I don't know if you're you, uh, familiar with these terms, but uh, it was uh, some laws that was passed by uh, Christians mostly. We have a, a very strong Christian. Uh, we called it. Uh, this is a group. Now we call it bancadas here. That's uh, some of the senators that they are from church and they join together and they put lo pass laws that uh, uh, do favors to, to churches and fuck uh, all people from other religions. And this was one of them. So if, you, if I threaten you in the Facebook, for example, I say, I, I'll do a. a they, they say you put a macumba <laughs> if you you do a, a curse on someone else it is a crime and if they get it right and go to the, the the police and everything you can eventually go to jail <clears throat> yeah i mean that's one of the things wh why they had laws in in uh, ancient samaria i mean i remember the the acadian law I just I saw a lecture at the British Library a couple of years ago by this guy and for his doctoral thesis he looked at a part of one of the cuneiform tablets that was broken off and had been reattached and he was uh, analyzing their punishments for witchcraft versus magic and basically in that time so now we have a very clear understanding that witchcraft was illegal magic was legal um, but witchcraft what it was was magic defined by magic used to hurt someone else. So that's what was illegal because they didn't actually use the word witchcraft. Of course, um, they have a they had their own word. Um, so it has nothing to do with goddish worship being illegal and uh, Solomonic magic or pre-Solomonic <laughs> high high magic being no. It's not like that. What it was was just you couldn't hurt someone with magic, and if they could prove that you were doing magic to hurt people, they could put you in jail. Um, uh, or uh, here in Brazil, the, the witchcraft is mostly associated with African religions. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, the, the traditional hermetics and stuff uh, it's, it's mostly Wicca and they, they don't take Wicca very seriously here so uh, that's the a good thing and everything is, is a girl thing but that's a great from thing. The, the point of his, the, the point of view of the law uh, to be an, uh, an African practitioner uh, from, from Umbanda or Kimbanda or Candomblé it, it is dangerous in, in Rio yeah. de Janeiro since the uh, uh, priests have associated with uh, traffic, marijuana and cocaine traffic. Oh, yeah. And they really enter uh, some of the temples and destroy that and, and kills some of the, the, uh, the priests from Banda. And it has, begun some, uh, has become something very serious, wow. mostly in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Huh. Wow. And in, in other parts of the country, it's, uh, it's getting worse. Like it begins in 2018 and is escalonating. Yeah. Do you, uh, well, I was, I was going to say, uh, it's sort of lucky that Wicca has the reputation. It's good. It's, it's protecting itself with this uh, reputation, right? Um, and I've thought about that. Like, what are the reputations we want to put forward for our spirituality and spiritual practices, right? Because based on our choices, we could end up 
uh, screwing ourselves over and getting into some trouble just based on how we present them. And, and, and that's where some people like EA quoting, quitting and, uh, you know, other uh, promoters of harmful magic are, you know, they're encouraging another satanic panic too. Plus they're, they're also speaking to the minds of mentally unstable people. That's a big problem, right? Um, <clears throat> magic does tend to attract people uh, who uh, are schizophrenic or, you know, need to ground down more than get all astral. And if you're teaching a kind of magic that's based around hurting someone else or getting revenge or becoming a living God who's only, who only answers to himself or herself or themselves or Satan, <laughs> then, yeah, that's going to scare a lot of people because it's going to, it's going to feed also into the minds of deranged people who lose it. And uh, yeah, we, it's no responsibility for, for the influence they're having in the world. And if you want to be a Satanist, it seems to me that that is definitely a way to uh, go against life. Though, of course, most of the Satanists I know, I've known are not like that at all. Actually, I tend to get along with most Satanists I know better than um, a lot of Christians, um, depending on their, their beliefs, you know. There's a, there's, a, there's a wide range of beliefs within the might makes right and Lex Talona sort of view of the world versus people who, for example, are very focused on virtue ethics and, and being, a, being right, but not, let, not taking any shit. Like there's also a sort of virtuous soft Satanism I see going on with some people where they're just tired of feeling fucked over their whole lives since they were born, which is a lot of people even up in uh, Canada and America, right? I mean, the biggest problem we have in Vancouver on the downtown east side where we have the largest homeless population in Canada and highest concentration of drug use in all of North America, of, ev of anywhere per capita in North America. Um, some have argued the world per capita, but that's a, who cares? Who cares? It's crazy. So working there, helping those people, the biggest problem they have is no socks. Like, they're not even worried about not getting food or anything. They don't have socks. That's the main thing they need is socks. And that's equivalent here, to... Here in Brazil, I believe it would be impossible to have a satanic church, an official branch. It was tried in the 70s. But of course. It was, it was taken right. like a, a joke. In the 70s, uh, the People of really course. don't think that, oh, he's really the devil's worship. Because if they, they thought something like that could be serious, they would destroy the temple. <laughs> <laughs> so it's mostly an internet thing here. Now, we do have satanists, we do have uh, um, uh, publisher houses that publish satanic books uh, from LaVey, from Grant, uh, from, from uh, authors, but yeah. it's mostly a digital thing and, and you buy it from the internet and you receive it in your home and mostly in a blank uh, package that d does not say Church of Satan in, in it. It's very discreet. I'd ah, say. okay. Well, you know, I wish everyone well practicing their spirituality. I mean, hopefully they don't hurt people. That's not cool, but but yeah, it's a it's such a dangerous line when you start impinging on on freedoms and people's right. It's right. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> it's it's the first time I never thought I'd see actual talk or acts of revolution in Canada or America in my lifetime. I didn't think I'd see that. I think you guys are a bit more familiar with it. Who's the guy in charge right now? Is it Bolsonaro? It's called Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro. And he's like, a, he's like this strong man dude, right? It's like, uh, think about Trump. He's a stupid Trump. He's a stupid. <laughs> That's like our guy. Our guy's a pretty <laughs> version of a stupid Trump, but probably dumber than Trump. He's not a pretty version of anything. He's like a, a, a military mixed up with church people. And, and, and he, he rose actually because the guy who were before him was like a mob, a, a mafia mob. And they, right. they stole a lot of the country, and left the country in debt and fucking up the lives of everyone. And they, he, he was arrested for corruption. Wow. Yeah. And the people were so angry that they went to choose anyone, anyone who said, I'm against that. And so he rose from the masses. He's like a, a, a Brazilian Hitler, if you could say so, because he, wow. he used the, the exactly same uh, strategy <laughs> that they used him. it in Germany. 
uh, um, and now they hunt communists here. <laughs> and if you, you declare yourself a, a socialist or a communist, you can be beaten up in the street, depending on where you are. Because uh, the masses really bought it, the, this, this talk. And now, oh, and everyone that's religion that's not Christian, and when I say Christian, it's not even Catholic, it's, it's what we call the Neopentecostal. It is this new church. It's, Neopentecostal, eh? Yeah, it is, it's most like a, a gambling machine, and they want money. Uh, oh, you know, I, I've seen in the United States, you have these televangelists that go on TV to ask for money. But yeah. here in Brazil, they, they sell water that cure cancer, uh, water that cure COVID. And now the priest who, who sold it is with COVID. He's in, in hospital now. <laughs> There are some things that happen in Brazil. We have a say that Brazil is not for the amateur. Oh I mean, it's true. The, the guy, the guy went on television to, to sell water and magic beans. I, I, I should not I, Google I would, that. It's, it's I'm, real. I'm going to go buy so some magic, magic beans, beans now. that can cure COVID. And now he's in the hospital with COVID. So, he should have so, took, taken his own medicine. Sure. No. If it's working. <laughs> yeah. From the, the also the thing with the beans is you're not meant to eat them. You have to put them inside up the I, I really don't know yeah. if we're supposed to trust eat me. I'm an that. expert on magic beans. It was, it was how, so how crazy it, that what was it like when um during that transition? Because this was in a recent lifetime. Um, what was it like living through that transition for you personally? Like what's going what's it like life on the ground like there? Because we see two versions of South American countries, usually the war and the fighting catastrophes and like they're going to kidnap us, um, that shit. And then Mel Gibson will come and save me. Yay. Thank you, Mel Gibson or whoever saves people now. I don't know who it is. Is Jason someone sa who saves people now? Who saves people? I don't know. Or someone saves people in Hollywood, I'm sure. Anyway, they come save me. And the other version we see is like the tourist version, you know, um, or if you're in the entrepreneurial sphere, the like go live off your laptop in a resort in Brazil, it won't cost you that much or, or Asia or somewhere like that. There's, I've had friends who have done that, you know, they're, they're making like three, four grand on their laptop and they just truck around throughout their twenties and thirties. Um, that was, that's also the thing, but the, you're only seeing part of the story there. And I don't have any sense of what it would be like to actually live there like you. I really don't have a sense of that. And I'm curious, like I see your board games on the wall behind you and, and like game books and also magical stuff. And you've got a great little environment there. And I just, I'm like, what would a day with the, what would a day in the life be like? Well, I'm kind of the, why well, I would be in the top 1% in Brazil. Yeah. yeah. And in the United States, I would be middle-class. Uh, but uh, lucky, here Brazil yeah. is a very poor country, and, and Sao Paulo is is apart from the rest of Brazil. So when you you say Brazil, you can think about Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro or the great capitals that have over two three million people, and in Sao Paulo we have twelve million people, uh, I, I believe more. At, but it is is apart from that, and if you go to the the interior. It's like uh, medieval. It's literally medieval. It runs around the church and the priest has a lot of power, political power and social power. And uh, since 2016 that we had our, our old, our last president Dilma that she was impeached. And it was, we, we lived in a, a verge of a civil war because Brazil is literally divided. The, we had the last 16 years, it was a socialist president and he broke the country and he uh, sent a lot of money to, to African governments and people here from Venezuela and Cuba and why, all the, why, these countries. Why would he do that? Yes, uh, it's, it's about the, the, the cause. So it's just because he gets money and instead of putting the money here in Brazil, he buys a new harbor in Cuba. Yeah. And of course, they are all over, uh, overpriced and they stole a lot of money and diverge a lot of money. So people here began 
to, to, to get really angry about that. But he was so um, well established politically. He was, he's a great politician. And so he had contacts with every, everyone. So the media here idolizes him. He's like the, the, the son of Brazil and the father of the poor. This is some of his titles. And he was arrested for corruption and a lot of, lot of stuff. He was convicted in several courts and he was uh, literally arrested. So in the, this last uh, election, we had a candidate that once, you know, once a week, he went to the jail, to the prison, to talk to this guy, to get instructions to, to run his campaign. Can you believe that? In Canada, someone who is a candidate for president, he goes to, to the prison once a, a week to talk to an inmate, to get consuls to run the country. <laughs> And it happened here. <laughs> and the other, the other guy was uh, his base of uh, of voters is, is people who think that saying a good uh, good thief is a dead thief, and mm. people who are pro guns and uh, extremely Christian uh, fanatic Christians. And so he rose up. He was a mostly unknown politician in twenty fourteen. And now he's uh, the new father of the poor, the man without corruption and shit like that. It's but it's, it's not true. Yeah, <laughs> it's not true. He's, yeah. He went 30 years in politics in Rio de Janeiro and he had not a single <sighs> bill of law approved. So he's a, a, a professional politic. Yeah. And now the country is literally divided. But for us who deals with magic stuff, it has been a dark dark times because since uh, from from some some years uh the the priests uh when i call priest is most uh is shepherd i don't know if that's in english uh they called pastor the the, the word is shepherd i don't know if the, it's, a, it's a valid word in english but it's the equivalent of priest into a neopentecostal church yeah the mm. preacher I believe the preacher would be the word. And they had a lot of schemes when they laundry money from drug dealers, especially in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, yeah. In Rio de Janeiro, have you seen, the, the, there's a movie here that it was called Cidade de Deus. It ran from the Oscar. And there's another movie that's called... Um, you mean City of God? City of God. Yeah. 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 It, it, I haven't it, seen that. Should I watch that? Yes, you should. Okay. This is a very well done uh, film and it is very real from yeah. the Brazilian point of view. So when you see this, this movie, you get a very good look at how it's like living in Brazil. My buddy went uh, just down the street from me uh, when that movie first came out. Actually, here's a funny fucking story. My buddy uh, was going to rent it and right in front of him someone else took it and the dude was jean-claude van damme <laughs> oh <laughs> and i was like what was he doing in this part of town and my buddy said well actually because of the part of town we live in he's like he did you not know he's gay i'm like i don't think he's gay he's like yeah that's why he's like staying here in this part of town in vancouver where i've always sort of lived and uh yeah anyway very weird story and that was i was like should I watch the movie? And he's like, yeah, you should definitely yes. watch it. I, he, he said he'd already seen it. So anyway, I will definitely go watch it now because I'm curious about that. And, uh, yes. you know, if it's good enough for uh, Mr. Split, then I guess I can handle it. No, I'm, I'm very curious about Brazil. It's, South America has always fascinated me. And but also I know because of how we're raised to see things up here uh, scared us. You know, so it scared me as well. Right. Like, um, yeah. And I, um, I'm sort of curious to explore that, you know, push my own comfort zone as well and see parts of the world like that. I'd really like to do that. But yeah, how did you, um, how did you become one of the 1%? Uh, I'm a, an author and I'm an architect. You're an architect. So, uh, yes, architect. I design uh, uh, mansions, uh, beach, beach houses, but for a oh, very, very cool. high level. Wow. And... 
I, I wrote several books. I have over 60 books published. Wow. And we distributed it through, we call it the Banca de Jornal, it's newsstands, but in, in, in America it's different. In America, newsstands, they only sold uh, news and, and newspapers, but here in Brazil, they distribute books in newsstands. Yeah. It was several years ago. Now, now we changed our way. Have you ever designed temples or ritual spaces? Because it sounds like you'd be a good yes. guy, architect to do that. Yeah, you have? Yes, I have. I have cited some, some temples from my Masonic brothers and one church. You designed, you architected a church, eh? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of it. It was yeah. very nicely done. Yeah, you'll have to ah, then, some I remember the name of the other film that you should say. It's called uh, Tropa de Elite. It's Elite Troop. I don't know what the English name would be. And it uh, tells the story about the, the police in Rio de Janeiro. But the special force, it's like the SWAT in Rio de Janeiro. Because hmm. in Rio, uh, you have the drug dealers. And they Rio is a, is a, is a city that's it's unbelievable. And you have the rich part of the city but it's uh, stuck between the beaches and the mountains. And in the mountains, there are these slums uh, and the houses that poor people uh, built in the 70s, the 60s. Mm. And they are um, ruled by drug dealers and they, they call themselves the, it's the fourth power. So you have mm. the mayor, but you have the drug dealers and they are far beyond power uh i believe it. i would say this thing and if you are listening to this in america you probably won't believe but the criminals here they have machine guns and, and weaponry and grenades and stuff for, that even our military does not have <laughs> oh my god and the, the police there they, they're just trying to survive but the real deal in rio de janeiro are the drug dealers and from some years uh, back, they started joining forces with the church, these this, uh, neo-Pentecostal preachers, because they laundry money from drug dealers in the church. In the church, yeah. And then they had the drug dealers of Jesus. I'm not kidding. That's the name. Os Traficantes de Jesus, the drug dealers of Christ. Oh, my God. And they went into this this villages and in city and stuff and began killing uh, the, the preachers from the Afro-American uh, religion. So in, in some cities, it is, uh, they are almost secret now because they, if they say that they are, they, they get expelled. We had a lot of ca uh, cases where the, the preacher, the, the uh, we call it Baba Lorisha, or Baba, is the, the sacerdote, the, the main man in a temple. He was kicked out of his house with the clothes of, that he was wearing and say, get out of here or we will shoot you. And then wow. they took him, destroyed his temple, and they are practically eliminating the Afro-American religions here in Brazil. So that sucks. That, that's that's the, the really dangerous awful part of yeah, being that's a, tragic a, a, and mostly here in brazil if you are dealing with spirit spirituality you have uh, the umbanda candomblé and kimbanda and in a smaller term you have the kardec the spiritism the cardicism hmm. i don't know what name you have in america because uh, i think cardicism is, is really famous here in brazil it started in france with Alain Kardec, okay, and uh, it came to Brazil, and then we had a, a guy in the eighties that was really, really famous. That was called Chico Xavier, that he wrote uh, psychographic books. I don't know if this is the the real term. Cool. Johnny Spirit possessed yeah. him, and he like he wrote automatic writing. Automatic writing, yeah. and he was really, really, really famous. And he went to TV and things like that. So Kardecism is now a, a, a huge religion here in Brazil. I'd say huge, but it's like 2%, 3% of the population. 
and this is a spirituality. And we have mostly the Umbanda, Candomblé and Kimbanda. Uh, Candomblé is, is the beginning, is the slaves' religion back in the uh, 1870s. That, that's the date, Eight, 870s, the, nine, the beginning of the 20th century. They had this religion that this, the slaves practiced but it was mingled with the Catholics. So we have the Orishas, that the cult. It's different than Voodoo and Santeria. Voodoo, you have a, a pantheon of Orishas and gods. Here in Brazil, no. The Portuguese, when they took the slaves to Brazil, they didn't bring them as families, but they separated off them. So in the, in the same, uh, house, we have the slaves, slaves from the Nago, Yoruba, Keto, several different um, regions from Africa. And they, they organized themselves together and to survive, they, they uh, mixed with it with the symbols from the Catholic Church. Yeah. So Oshala became Jesus and uh, you have some God, uh, some, some of the Orishas became some of the saints. So in this cult, we have a kind of a mix and you have a Catholic statues and the Orishas. And then in 1990 and 1919, they began with the Umbanda. That's a, it's a mixture of the Kardecism, Candomblé and a bit of the Catholicism. Hmm. So this is what we, we call the Afro religions here. Huh? Hmm. And Kim Buddha is the, devoted to Eshu and uh, Pombajira and the, the other things that you really like in the United States. <laughs> we have some authors here that specialize just to, to talk about the issue, like Umberto Magri or Nicolaj Frisvold. Hmm. And they're great authors who, who have some books about that. Oh, cool. What was the what was your first magical tradition that you experienced? Uh, my first magical tradition was Umbanda. I dealt a little bit with witchcraft. I lived in London for for a year, but when I came back to Brazil, there was nothing like that, hmm. and I was fascinated with this concept of about possession. How how do, can a guy? He's sitting like that, and there's a ritual, and then he's possessed by a spirit. And then he says things that, that the medium cannot know about. And he can he talks about things that are so profound and so great that there has to be something different or, or at least bizarre. And science couldn't explain that. Oh. So that was my start. That's why I got to, to do that. And then I joined the Freemason. And here we, in Brazil, we had in the 90s and uh, the beginning of 2000s, we had a Masonic Lodge that was called Madras, that was based from the Madras Publisher House, that was the biggest esoteric publisher house in Brazil. And the owner of that, that was Wagner Veneziani Costa, and he was uh, a Freemason and he invited several of the authors to became masons. So we have meetings there just to study uh, the occult. It, it was really like a Brazilian golden dawn of hmm. that era. Wow. Were you, were you part of that then? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, for me, it was really special. Uh, I was uh, separated from my first wife and I had uh, really no place to go at night. So I went to Freemasons and Umbanda temples and Kimbanda temples uh, from Monday to Sunday. So, so was, <laughs> there a lot of, was there a lot of Monday to Sunday? Yeah, that sounds like my experience <laughs> in the Golden Dawn. Um, was there a lot of intermixing between the Freemasonry and, and Ubanda and, and other magical practices? Uh, in this lodge specifically, but we had other lodges that were dealt, deal with the occult. We had a lodge that was called Alastair Crowley. And we had a lodge that's called Telema uh, because their members were all Telemites. Wow. And Masonic this, lodges this, of only Telemites. Yeah. 
Only telemites. <laughs> we don't we don't have OTO or anything like that. I mean, Lomino came to Brazil in the 80s, and in Rio de Janeiro they had some some OTO lodges, but they have 20 people, 30 people, and yeah. doesn't get any bigger than that. Uh, That's okay. We have the Amorque and Tom. That the, the Amork is the uh, is yep. big here in the occult uh, students, mostly because you can study from house, from your house. Yeah, yeah. you have the, the their their texts, so they had a lot of people. I believe I have my, uh, I have my card. I was two hundred and forty one thousand, two hundred and forty one thousand six hundred something people. So there's a lot of a lot of people in the Amork. Yeah, I posted my card on Instagram a while back, my card from 1996, though I was a member from like 93, but I was in the junior order of the Torchbearers because I was like 12. And then in 96, when I was 15, I went down there and they let me in the adult stuff. And then I was so disappointed by the, the depth of the adult stuff. That's when I bit the bullet and called the Golden Dawn Temple that was <laughs> run by Nineveh Shadrach and uh, joined that by the end of 2006 yeah where was did you ever practice much golden dawn magic uh in the the madras we had some guys from uh the golden dawn tradition and we started a small group but uh, didn't go so so much far because at that time there was no internet the way we had now so yeah. we had to base everything on books yeah we people started don't realize, a lodge. people don't realize how little access we had to information in the 90s like you could read through, like it was only, it only took you a few years to read through pretty much all the good occult books um, in the nineties. Like, you know, I mean, other than the fluffy stuff, but the major operational stuff, the good theory, the really good quality books. Yeah. You could go through it in a few years. Um, and now it's, now it's just exploded, of course, which is good. Yeah. Is, has, has there, um, I know there's a little golden dawn in, in Brazil, what do you know about them? And we have a, a, the, the golden ball, the golden dawn practice that we used to have, where it was mixed up with Umbanda and Kimbanda. Wow, that's so super they, cool. Yeah, because we we had some things that were very nice, some experimentations that we did, because uh, mostly of the, the people who are dealing with the golden dawn tradition were priests in the Kimbanda tradition. Oh, wow. So they were mediums, and they 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 could uh, be possessed by Yeshus. So some of them we did some of the rituals, and some of the people there uh, were possessed, and then they the spirits the Yeshus talked to us about the rituals of the Golden Dawn. What do they say? <laughs> they they saw the magic flowing, and they say this is a really nice stuff. And oh really? Do the the. We have a have... pentagram and the stuff, and they say, Oh, that works. They like because they could see it in astrally. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so everything the here in Brazil is a, is a mixture. Uh, yeah. you, you you probably have some if you say if you, you meet a Brazilian and he say he will probably be a cow's magician, and if not, he's a, a Kabbalist or but he he will have to be a some sort of degrees in this spirituality. Because okay. uh, we, we have a saying here that se não funciona, você foge pro terreiro. It's in Portuguese. Uh, if it doesn't work, you can always run to the terreiro. <laughs> and you can I... talk to spirits and the spirits. If you messed up with your magic, you can go to the, the, <laughs> the temple and the spirits will help you out. No. I, I, a Brazilian I... saying. I know my friend, my Freemason friend uh, in Scotland, he'll hear that and he speaks Portuguese. So he'll, he'll, uh, he'll appreciate that. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a cool guy. Uh, you should actually talk to him at some point about, you should have him on the podcast. He does a cult, he does a, a cult publishing and uh, is a really knowledgeable uh, Freemason guy. And he speaks Portuguese, which is cool. His, his wife's Brazilian, I believe. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and he's a, you know, capoeira <laughs> master, dude. But yeah, um, it's very cool to me that the spirits of that tradition, the Umbanda? Umbanda. Umbanda. Yeah. 
we're uh, Umbanda. in, we're in Madras, uh, they were mostly the Umbanda because one of the founders of one of the branches of Umbanda was a member of that lodge, uh, Ruben Sarraceni and Cumino, Alexandre Cumino, they, they were heads of this, uh, this Umbanda that they. This Umbanda was not really, really, really into the African um, roots of the Umbanda. So you, you could uh, be possessed by a spirit of a Templar or an alchemist or someone that didn't have to identify itself as an Indian or, or some, someone from the woods or some, some... We call here in Umbanda, we have the several lines. I don't know if the people who are listening to are familiar with this. So you have the Orishas that are the spirits. And they, uh, the most amazing thing is that these Orishas, they are really well connected to the spheres of the tree of life. So if you imagine the tree of life and you have these spirits, you can uh, compare them. So for example, in Keter, we have the, the, the Gemini that's called the Ibeji that they're the children um, and it's the pure spirits. And then you have from Hokuma, we have the Baianos, that they're the people from Bahia. And in Bina, we have the Preto Velhos, is the old black man. And we have in that is the Pretas Velhas, the old ladies, the old black ladies. And hmm. these old black ladies, they are just like the Norse, the, 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 the tree. Uh, hags, uh, I forgot their names. The Norns. You have in Greek the, the Norns. Norns. Yeah. And they're just like that. Do you they're, think they're, they're the same? same if you see, the same spirits. They're the same you think, spirits. You the think same, the same spirits. spirits. I have, I have no doubt about no it. No doubt. Okay. They are the same spirits. They have the same energy, the same patterns, and they say. And some uh, at a point, I even asked one of them, uh, "Are you related to this, this, this?" And I said the names in Greek, and she said, "Yes, we are." But we don't answer by that name anymore. So the, that that was a point, and I say, okay, well, but, but it's logical, you know. If the spirits are immortal and they are on the other side, and we are here living our lives, the, the same entities that were uh, the Vikings or, or the Indians and the Greeks, they they are here some somewhere, hmm. and they answer to that that names. And we have from Gebura, we have the Ogun, the Caboclos. Yeah. We have uh, from Tiferet, we also call the Caboclos, but it's like uh, the guy from the farm would say that in a translation. I don't think there is a translation from Caboclos. And down we have the Shu and Oshun from Hod and Netza. The uh, Oshun is like the spirits of water. So when a girl with the his he or she is possessed by this Oshu spirits, and people have to be, be wetting uh, him or her with water all the time. It is very nice to, to, to see that. It is very beautiful to see uh, these possessions here. Oh, wow. And finally, yeah. we have the, the sale, salesman that is Yemanja, Yezod, and Malkut, that is Shapana. Shapana is the, the uh, uh, spirit of the dead. Uh, they call the doctor of the poor people. Mm. Because at the same time, he's the, the um, carrier of all diseases, but also the, the doctor who cure all diseases. Yeah, I like that. And they are very colorful. If you Google it, the Orishas from Brazil. Do you have a, do you have a good book you can recommend that would be in English? Uh, there is a very famous uh, French book from Pierre Verger that's called The Orissas. I, I believe it's the most famous for from someone who's not Brazilian. And we had some books from Nicolas Fritzvolt about the issue and the tradition. I believe he is very famous uh, outside Brazil. Okay. And we have some books on, on Pombagira and Exu from Umberto Maggi. And he, he's also famous outside Brazil. Yeah, no, I know that name. And um, they are really nice people. You should interview them. I would love to. I, I don't know if I don't know if Maggie speaks fluently English. I probably he probably does. 
he would be a, a very nice to talk to you. Yeah, that sounds like fun. He's Italian, right? I don't know. Uh, no? I interviewed him in Portuguese. I oh, he's, he's Port Brazilian. He's Brazilian. Oh, sorry. I just assumed from the Umberto. He's Brazilian. Nicolás is from Norway, I think. But he speaks fairly good Portuguese and fluently English. You have no trouble. Okay. Yeah, no, I'd love to love to interview them. A card game. All right, we're back. We have a board game, a card game. And I'm chewing on THC gum, so yeah, or licorice. Mm. Yeah, uh, you have a Kabbalistic board game. A yes, I board have game. A, a Kabbalist board game, but it's not so, um, how would I say, obvious that's Kabbalah. You, oh, you okay. must know Kabbalah to, to understand how. Mm. It's a board game much like Dungeons and Dragons from... It has a, the rules are simple as the Hero Quest game. So and it's you have a party. RPG, RPG Quest. Called RPG Quest. Yeah. Yeah, not everyone's going to see the video. Most people will just be listening. They won't see the video. But that's right. their own fault. They but, should subscribe. But if they know board games, they will probably know the Hero Quest game. It was a, a, a oh, yeah. huge thing in the oh, 80s. Yeah. So the, it's very, very simple. It was designed for children. But the point is that you have four classes that were based on the four elements. So um, the earth would be the warrior and the fire would be the wizard and the water would be the cleric and the air, the thief. So mm. you could uh, uh, join these elements in your class. And the tabletop, the map, it was based on the yeah, affairs of the Kabbalah. So I will show you, but if you are listening to it's an cool. extra, so you can say a plateau of hot. Oh yeah, plateau de hot. The hot. Oh. And here you have the, the woods of Hesed. <laughs> Vasquez de Hesed. Vasquez de Hesed. And the plains of Tiferet. Planches de uh, Tiferet? The Tiferet. Planiches. Plan How do you say that? Planiches? Planices. Planices. Planices is planes from Planices. the magic game is when you get the white mana from magic. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. play a bit of that on my phone. Yes. And you say a Hokma volcano. <laughs> really, the Hokma. Hokma. So you mix it up, everything, and you, you build your map. Yeah, so the map is built. It looks so, sort of so like a map, Settlers of Catan sort of map building. Thing. Yes, it's very similar to sort of the uh, Settlers of Catan map. It's hexadecimal. And uh, so you have a, a map that's also the Tree of Life because it has all this, the Sephiroth on it. And now the missions are given by, given by the tarot cards. So, for example, you meet uh, a wizard. Uh, you, you, you could, or you could meet a fool, and then the fool asks you for something, and he wants to get something from Keter and something from Bina. Mm. And that's the design from the Golden Dawn. If you imagine the Tree of Life, and the, the I'm sorry, the fool would be from Keter to Hokma. Mm -hmm. So the fool would ask a mission that you have to travel to the board from Keter to Hokma to retrieve these items. And if you find, for example, a hermit, and he would ask you to go from Tiferet to Hesed to get some items. So you travel in the Tree of Life. But since you have oh, wow. uh, this map that is all mixed up. Uh, that every, can be a long every, way to travel. It can to be a, a long way in, in one uh, play and a short way in another. The map is always different. So the missions are always different. Oh, very cool. And this time is we have the, the orcs and gnomes and goblins and, and everything. They're related to the, um, the elements. So you can play it, but you can also play it like a tarot card reading. So it's a kind of an oracle too. We had people here who tried playing solo yeah. uh, as an oracle. Wow. So you, you, you have a bigger monster that uh, he has a uh, his has uh, some of the elements. So for example, you can have a monster that's a dragon that's mostly fire and some 
earth. You can have a, a vampire that's air and, and earth and something like that. They have combinations of the elements that they are the problem. That can, they can re be related to a problem. It can be uh, used as an oracle. Wow. And then you travel through the tree of life gathering power and get, getting weapons that are based on elements. So in the end, you can fight and win that monster. That's awesome. So, uh, an adventure board game that you can use for divination. Yes, yeah. and then when you finish it, you will have a tarot reading card. So you have this, this uh, characters and you have this problem based on the uh, elements and you have the tarot cards that gave you missions to get powers to fulfill and to fight and win the main problem in the tree of life. It is a game and an oracle. Fucking hardcore, dude. That's amazing. Did you design this with your friends? Yes. Uh, we have all yeah. this. Uh, the Great. Drawing, everything is Brazilian. Great production design. Yeah. I mean, I spent years working with uh, for Golden Laurel Entertainment uh, on a board game and then a card game. And the board game was so much work. Like, uh, and I was in charge of like distribution and uh, advertising. Mainly that was what my job was and dealing with the production out of China, of course. And like the disaster, it was a disaster. You hear, I don't know if I, I don't want to repeat this story, but, but I've never talked about this, this, this uh, segment of my life before to people. So I'm wondering if, I, but like they delayed the shipment. And then we found out it's just because they ordered a crate too small. All they had to do was like drop, a bunch of games and they could have got the shipment out on time like ditch 60 boxes of games sure to get the oh, shipment on time instead they said oh we'll order a new crate which delays it three months of shipping which means we miss all of our conventions and deadlines and and distributions we're like for 60 boxes you delayed it and they oh didn't tell God. us that they didn't give us and it was Carol Rettmeyer's, the American uh, production uh, head there. And then we found out afterwards, they didn't, the part of our team designing it, the people who hired me, they didn't do their due diligence, right? They didn't look at reviews of her work. They found someone, they they got a quote, and then they went with it. And, you know, the whole project was was hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to do oh the board game. I think the board game, just for the printing and manufacturing itself, was around 150000 dollars to make no, in copies. brazil we are about 20 years behind that <laughs> oh, but in my game you could play crowley oh that's a crowley <laughs> the little crowley yeah look at that he looks so handsome and rich he was a rich yeah, guy you know pe people don't talk about that much do you ever think about the fact that he had so much money when he was so young he had a lot of money and a lot of time in his yeah. hands. He yeah. was devoted to, to study magic. That's why he got to where he, he got, I think. Because he could devote himself to the art. If he had to, to had a job and then <laughs> stay from, from 8 to 5, I don't think he would go that far away. No, or no, yeah, uh, some, for some sure. Some of the characters. You know, you divided it uh, in elements. Just hold it down a bit. Oh. Uh. His captain, Capito Urdio, cool. Yeah, he had his two earth and two air, and they got their powers from that. So you could you could play like that. But we used to to build everything here in Brazil. The the stuff with China is from five thousand pieces or more, and and the industry in Brazil from board games is very small. So uh, production here is about, uh, I'd say, a thousand board games. Uh, yeah. If it's a really, really big hit like this one, that I'll show you, it's 2,000 pieces. This is one of mine. It's oh, called wow. Small Churches, Big Business. <laughs> I love the, the businessman and, and the student, this... the, the pyramid and the eye logo. And in this card game, you play uh, a preacher uh, with a church, and you have the you have the goal to be rich and to explore the faithful. <laughs> so you can sell shit then and magic stuff and bullshit. Explain the faithful. You can <laughs> you can buy um, houses and mansions and TVs. And, program channels i don't know if you have that in the united states in brazil we have uh, 
whole channels in television that are owned by the church. Wow. I don't know if you have that in Canada. We have uh, newspapers no. that are owned by the church. We have radio. Uh, no, we're, we're, putting all of, we're putting all our ministers and religious leaders in jail where they belong. Yeah. And yeah. the fun thing about this is that they are based <laughs> on real stuff. So, for example, you have some cards uh, to attack and other stuff. So, say, this is a. Uh, here's a card. Very cool. It's, the, it's called Pastor Engravida Duas Jovens, e diz que foi obra do Espírito Santo. In English, would be the, a preacher impregnated two young women and say it was Holy Spirit. I just say, oh, this is unbelievable. That, but if you Google, yeah. if you Google that, this is a real stuff. It happened in Brazil. Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did uh, we did some stuff like that for the card game I designed Here, called uh, uh, Harry Potter is Harry Potter is from the demo. <laughs> <laughs> so you're using actual Brazilian news and headlines to create sensational yes. titles and drama. Yeah, that's that's very clever. Yeah. Oh my god. So we, we went into the news from here. And and I, I I tried to show this to my friends in other countries that they didn't believe. <laughs> they said, What? Your game makes no sense. Why would a preacher steal money from, from his people and i say what part of that you do not understand and, and people in norway in denmark they, they didn't believe th this was a, a serious game this would work because it was so nonsense to them <laughs> wow yeah um it, it is sort of, there was a, the year i was the years i was doing the the working for game design um there was one game that came out that was about blowing up terrorists and they couldn't get they were not invited to any conventions even some conventions they registered for they were canceled at the last minute these guys were not welcome and then they were at a las vegas convention with us next to our table and so we had like you know galactic destiny and kill the hippies and they had like bomb, <laughs> bo you know kill the terrorists board game their game was incredibly successful sold through the first five thousand like that like that like they were so confident in their game. They didn't even want to do a game trade where we gave them our game and they gave us their game. They're like, no, no, that's cool. We'll, we'll, we'll buy yours and you can buy ours. It's like, whoa. Um, okay. It's, it is what it is. But yeah, there, uh, it was a very heretical and a blasphemous game. Our game was also very blasphemous. So it was called kill the hippies and it was making fun of the radical right and the radical left back in 2007. Um, actually, I, I haven't ha ever owned my own copy really, but I finally found one in England for sale and it would cost me like a hundred dollars. It's a $20 game. It's a 20 on the box it says 20 bucks. And it cost me a hundred dollars to buy the last one I've ever seen for sale. And it's in my wrapper, right? Like barely out of my reach right there. And it's in a box with the original game that I printed out when I designed it, like the, the, the test run cards for the demo. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad I actually have a copy of that now. I'm not sure if I'm going to open it to play it with my friends, but it is a lot of fun and very blasphemous images that, uh, you know, like there's a church war card um, that has images of two churches and the people all attacking each other and like peeing on each other's churches and fighting each other because that's how it is, right? You know, you got yes. the, first, the first reformed church of Jesus Christ and a block later you have the second reformed church of Jesus Christ and then you have the third reformed church and they all started as one but then the devil got in so some people left and they made a new church then the devil got in again and they started made a new church, right? And this is how it goes. Yeah. Um, so we made fun of yes. that as much as possible. We had like a font of, you know, like there's a picture of a person praying before a fountain of re-virginization so that they can become a virgin again yeah. these sort of ideas <laughs> but we also make fun of like the yeah, yeah maybe i'll grab it later and show you a few cards before uh but before in, in, in canada i don't think they would sell you uh holy pens that could make you get a better est score P i don't think people would buy it maybe maybe they <laughs> would in the wouldn't States. buy that it's so ridiculous i mean we, we had this on the tele on television People, people support, support Nigerian princes all the time. So who knows? Like there's people out there that will, uh, Hey, some people out there even support like 
you know, practicing magic and podcasts about the occult. So some people are just nuts, <laughs> you know, talking to witches and Freemasons and stuff. It makes me think, have you ever wondered, like, so if, like, if, if the magicians who work with the Goetia, they claim such powerful manifestations and powerful actions from those spirits, why haven't they changed overall countries like Brazil? Like, why can't a bunch of serious magicians with these great powers in Brazil just, like, use some yeah. demons to change things? Have you, do you think about this ever? I think about this sometimes. Yes, we, we, we usually ask them, if you are selling this rich spells, why you are not rich? Well, that's a different why thing than changing culture, I think. <laughs> why don't you just win the lotto? with your magic numbers and you're trying to sell it for others. But we have that here in Brazil. They have a lot of that. Well, the, the quick answer, there's an answer to the, the making money with magic thing. It's like magic is very much tied to your spiritual path in life, right? And your power, some people believe your power as a magician is tied to being in harmony with your higher self, which you know, makes you more than you are and gives you some ability to interact with the cosmic matrix of nature and spirits that manufacture it. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about personal finances, you're talking about your personal path, right? And there always has to be some sort of energy exchange. But when you're talking about getting spirits to cause an earthquake, if you can get a spirit to cause an earthquake, why can't you get a spirit to help out in a political situation or, you know, in uh, global crisis i don't know this is something i i think it's it's i think these are questions that are that we should ask i don't know yeah, we, should, we definitely should ask the, this kind of questions but i believe this uh when you you're into magic and you say oh i'm gonna be rich and powerful and stuff and people who are really into magic they they, they don't feel like being rich you say why would i have a, a 20 million dollar car it's pointless it became something that uh, if you live a very good life with friends and everyone and you're happy and you're healthy and you're doing something that you like in your job so this is rich for for us in in brazil this is really difficult because the, the vast majority of the young we call them jovem mystico that the, the young mages but it's a kind of a satirical. When you say jovem mystico, is like um, we're making fun of them because the, you're young and you don't know shit. That's why you are young mystical. And they usually get it, but they live with their parents and they, they don't do much. They, they are in school and they are mostly into magic to just get some woman or some guy or to be rich or to kill his enemy or something like that, they, they don't go to the next phase. They, 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 don't, they don't even go to this spiritual um, enhancement. Well, so a lot of them claim that there is no next phase, right? Yeah. Like, so I was reading John King. He thinks visualization is, is stupid and, and a point, pointless exercise. He thinks that has nothing to do with magic at all. And Stephen Skinner does talk sometimes along similar lines suggesting that a lot of what people practice in their spirituality has nothing to do with operational magic you know so i can understand what they're saying i don't necessarily know if they're right or not um or how much how useful it is to separate magical practice and control of spirits and manifestation of wonders how how useful i don't know where the line is in it, that's relationship to spirituality. Like, how does that relate to your spirituality? Because you have, you know, de facto, you have a spirituality. Whether you understand it in any sort of structured way or not, you still have one. I mean, the things that you do that give you life and, and, and the feeling of fullness are part of your spirituality. And so people who, for example, just play board games or are just on Twitch, like gaming on Twitch all the time, if they're like, feeling magnified in their human life but they're having life abundant and and you know they feel that this glory of god is them being fully alive playing their video games on twitch like sure yeah i think that that makes sense that you can you can you can magnify your soul in that way 
but when you practice magic it seems like those those spiritual traits are going to come through in your magical practice so i don't know how much you can separate your spirituality from a magical practice even though people like skinner uh, and others would claim that magic and spirituality have nothing in common just sort of similar like king suggests says that visualization and all this uh, stuff in the golden dawn he calls it just new age he says it's just new age which i don't know what the victorian era has to do with the new age um and i don't think you can apply a term from 100 years later to a something back then i think that's uh you know intellectually sloppy or lazy um especially definitionally you're not you're not going to define things very well if you define things in the past by terms in the present um so it still leaves us with a question of of in magic what are we what are we doing in the world versus what are we doing to ourselves do you know what i mean that's something that i, sh I should tell you because here in brazil what do we say uh, for magic like the ceremonial stuff and, and golden down stuff and the, the lodges and etc it's for the rich but when i say rich in brazil i'm talking a middle class america when I say middle oh, yeah, class yeah. in Brazil, I'm, I'm saying uh, people who live in trailers in the United States have a better life than the, the low class, middle class in Brazil. And when I say poor in Brazil, I don't really think you can understand what is the real poor people from the third world country. So for the, the really, really poor people, the church is like a refugee. So they can go so they have nothing and they, they just embrace what this guy is telling them that they had to suffer that they have to, to pay the, the money to the church then when they die they will go to heaven and they will be healthier and, and rich and etc in the next life and in yeah. brazil we don't have education so the, the majority of the people they don't, don't even know how to read and write really uh, because here in brazil thanks to that mob boss that we had as a president, he decided that if you can draw your name, you are considered uh, someone who, who literally. Oh, no. If you can draw, if, if oh. I can draw, Marcello, I don't even have to know what is written. Oh, God. But if you can draw your name, this, this is the right word, draw. It's not write your name, it's draw your name. You are considered literate. So we have like 70, 75% of our population that are, are uh, illiterate, uh, is, is what you call practical illiterate. Even if you can read it, you can't understand what it's written. So this is a real huge problem. And that's why the, the church and this um, pop, populist leaders that are authoritarian got to the power. And uh, we probably won't get them out of them and if we get we will put the other one that is a criminal and it's even worse so we are really fucked here yeah you know this yeah. time and for someone we we did have some cases of people who were uh, accused of witchcraft and they got beat, beaten up to death you've and, had witches uh, beaten to death recently yes she wasn't a witch they said she was a witch i don't yeah. even know if she was probably it not got on the news they, they yeah. accused the, the, a girl so we are in this this kind this point right now in brazil so when i tell you oh the freemason uh, for rich people no, we're middle class it's the guy who has a store a, a shop uh, some some shop on the mall and this is the upper class the practical yeah we yeah. have the uber richer people that are internationally rich the yeah. ceos from big yeah, tech yeah. but that's a, a a portion of the people that are so small yeah you can count, count all count. of them and they they don't give a shit about magic most of the politicians they do have their voodoo priestess uh, the preacher and the, they are dealt uh, in kimbanda and umbanda to protect really? themselves especially uh in northwest and, and uh, Bahia and that 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 parts of Brazil they, they so, are really tight. Are you so you're telling me that spiritual. wealthy people with power in Brazil use magicians and hire magicians? <laughs> yes, 
not well, uh, in a that might be light, that might be yes. why it's hard to overthrow them magically because they're using magicians right so maybe be, maybe what be. we need is more magicians to do more magic for these things i'm very interested in using magic for uh causing change in the world especially in ways that doesn't necessarily affect or benefit yourself ways that are benevolent and good for you like everything i do that isn't for me is much more powerful than stuff i do that is for me you know because my i know my higher self doesn't give a shit how much money i have it doesn't give a shit it just wants me to do what i'm told like you know it's like you can do this and be in maximum alignment with me and you'll feel the effects of that alignment or you can do other things and be a little less in alignment or you can do whatever you want and maybe not feel that connection at all and so you know it just wants me to have enough to keep doing what i'm doing doing the true will as we talked on your this podcast magical thought is what we do have but in the upper class here that's the middle class there yeah it's not uh, something you, you worry about eat. when you're starving right you have you, you have a nice house you live in a nice place you don't have to worry about uh, unemployment or yeah. anything like that so you can focus your energy on the golden down rituals you go to the freemason and you go to the golden down and to, to some tejero and you uh, per pursue this higher life but the the vast majority that came into contact with magic here in brazil they're coming from the the lower classes and through internet so chaos magic is a huge hit here in brazil uh, chaos magic got, uh, is i don't a... know if you have the inter interview with tommy kelly he designed the 40 servants i think he's i've a heard a really tommy great kelly. guy <laughs> yeah. he's an artist from scotland yeah yeah and no i know a who great tommy guy kelly. yeah he's, yeah and yeah. here in brazil he's his uh, deck of 40 servants got uh, as famous as catholic saints <laughs> because people were photocopying it awesome. and getting oh my God. pdfs and printing it and praying to the servants so they, they're takes. not like servants and they they usually uh, get servants like the car now and things are singing and then he they, they would went to facebook they have groups of over a hundred and 120 thousand people and he was wow. saying, I would like to thank Karno for the graces that I achieved. And Karno <laughs> is a servant that he used to fuck someone, to, to get a girl or a boy. So that, that, can, that can say a lot about Brazil. And the, <laughs> we have some servants that are overly used and some servants that are just forgotten. Yeah, And, and they were the treating them like, like uh, saints. So these are Tommy Kelly's servitors from Chaos Magic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, it's it, that's amazing. He I was shocked, believe. and I told him that. I interviewed him, and he didn't believe he didn't that. Know? He, he said, didn't it's know. not possible. I said, yes, welcome to Brazil. It is possible. <laughs> People are worshiping. They are using it worshiping to the, the most basics. Oh, man. Yes, they are worshiping <clears throat> the servitors. But they use their servitors to get access to basic stuff. Like I, I'm unemployed. I don't have food. Yeah. Uh, I went to 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 have sex with that girl, and and basic, uh, very very low standards. Food, food, employment, food. and sex. That's what Freud but said. They are really... That's what Freud said. Love and love and food and sex, work and sex. No, that's what Freud said. Sex. Work and sex or work and love as some people like to interpret it but yeah um if you don't have that yeah magic's always been a powerful tool for both yeah the rich and the poor it's it's interesting it's um one of these common factors that you see uh, it really challenges the notion that magic is some borderline superstition that that doesn't really play a major role in our lives as we're going through right now we're unredacting some of history there's a lot of because of the internet and uh, the development of technology people independent scholarship and, and new information is traveling so fast right so fast there's a new archaeological dig and we all know about it like as soon as they post the first information 
And all of a sudden we have our, our understanding of a whole chunk of history changed. I don't know if you've seen some of the magical scrolls they're uncovering in these amazing digs, like things written on, on full snake skins, like spells and spells and spells of all this stuff. If you pay attention to the archeology span coming out of the you know, Middle East and stuff, it's, uh, it's fascinating. Wow. Magic, baby. Uh, there's, there's another thing that is interesting to mention. Uh, we have uh, in this war, this religious war with yeah. the, um, the preachers and the, the Afro religion, uh, they are moving the public opinion against the Afro religion because we have the, the sacrifice of animals in the rituals. Um, you know, voodoo has it, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. I think, uh, I think most people land, like to pretend that they don't actually do the sacrifices. Yes, in Umbanda, you don't have uh, sacrifices, but, but, but they do have because they're mostly from Candomblé. So yeah. they do, but they don't say that they do. Because they if do. you say, if you have a sacrifice yeah. and then you move and then they, they, they will get the people uh, from PETA and from the, anima, the yeah. animals side protected. And they will say that they do black magic and they torture animals and stuff like that to turn uh, public opinion against uh, yeah. Afro religion. Have it's, have you been part of a magical here. ceremony where they've had a sacrifice? Several times. Several times. What am several, I talking about? Times. I'm like, I'm so <laughs> sheltered. I'm so sheltered. Oh, man, I'm, I'm from Brazil. This is dude. We do I, no, I live It's in not a sacrifice. Land. It is a, um, the main the main stuffs like that. You begin the ceremony, and then the. the priest or priestess, the temple uh, responsible, they, they got possessed. And then the entity usually kills the animal, but it kills him in a very fast, very humane way. And then the animals are prepared and served. So in the next day, we have a, a huge party. It's, it's not party, it's not the term, Par, a party is a lot more recreational. It's a celebration where we ate the animal's food. So it's not a sacrifice in the sense of, oh, we are just killing yeah. animals without meaning. And the, the, the food is, uh, is prepared. So in a way, the celebration is the same. If I go to the market and buy chicken yeah. and, and, and lamb yeah. and stuff, it, this is the same meat. And if you go just on the Sunday, you won't even know that it was a sacrificed animal. Yeah, That's so, so it, they are very, they are made in a very, very serious and, and, and uh, respectful way. The sacrifices, it is part of the religion. Now, what's what's I love it. I love all of that. That's that's amazing. I mean, I feel myself that I need to have. I would like to have more of a connection with my food. Like I've got, I've, I'm like uh, immunosuppressed, autoimmune diseases. I got all that fucking shit. You know, like got a bad deal on the genetic health thing um i got a good deal on some other stuff so i don't care but i have to eat a lot of meat and i have very little connection to meat production and i've always wanted to learn more about like i wanted to connect more with the animals i eat i think i mean we can't go back to how the first nations or the indigenous people would do it we can't go back to that unfortunately um we got we've come too far but I do think it would be really healthy for us spiritually to connect with where our food comes from, not just when it comes to meat eating, but whatever it is, our diet is that's most healthy for our body. It'd be really nice, whether it's gardening, like we just planted some fresh um, herbs on, on the deck here. You know, it's, it's not much, but it's what we can do. And it's better than not doing it, I think, for a connection to, you know, that way they take the bay leaves and put it in the food. I love cooking. We have to cook a lot of our own food for uh, the diet. Um, yeah, I wish we I wish we could all connect ceremonially to our our sustenance in uh, in a much realer way. That'd be really great. I'm very scared of what's going on with like genetically modified stuff and I've I've watched a, many many hours, like dozens of hours on how they're taking over crops in in South America by by getting their their patented stuff to fly between the fields. And it's like, "Oh, our shit we did we get our shit on your crops?" I'm sorry, now we own them. That's crazy. And we yeah. don't hear that talked about much at all. I mean, seriously. Like, do you know anything about that? 
yes, and unfortunately, oh, yes. Uh, my, I love my that you said, grow... oh, yes, but I'm also very sad. Oh, my, my God. My wife grew up in a farm, and she used it to, to kill the, the food. And they had the, the, the cow and cattle and everything. And uh, once a month, they, they got, get their family together, and they kill uh, an ox or a cow, and then they prepare the whole body of her. so she's used to this kind of things with animal she has a, a mostly spiritual relationship with, with this animal but they don't say it's uh, like a ceremony it's, it's part of na nature for them uh, I traveled with my wife to Egypt last year you before the, the pandemic and we went with the Nubians to, to look the at you going look at you desert. husband taking your wife on vacation to Egypt Damn. Uh, we went to, to follow Crowley's path. Uh, I, I actually, I was in Portugal. I was in either. Portugal for some lectures and, and teaching class. And the guys from Golden down there, they had, they plan every year they go to somewhere in the world, uh, some places. So I went uh, to Cancun then to see the pyramids and everything. And that, that year uh, we went to Egypt. So they, they spent a whole year uh, planning all, everything. And they get uh, an Egypt guide and uh, all the stuff. So we, we spent about 20 days and it was the best trip of my life. We went to the desert with the guides. So uh, the, our group get a camel and we went one day to the, the desert and we stay in the oasis there. And in the night, I could see Nuit in the sky. Really? And she is real. She is real. Nuit is real. When you are in the middle of the desert, and you look up and you see the, the stars, you, you, there's no way you can't believe that she is there watching us. That, that's the real magic. That it was when you look up and she is over there, over your head. Yeah. And we went with this, this Nubian and they sacrificed a goat to, to their meal and we could eat with them. And it was a really uh, religious sacrifice, I believe, but they call it uh, normal life hmm. we, we get this since we are so disconnected from our food that when we see these things happen and when i go to the farm uh, to visit my, my wife's family they usually kill some some animals to prepare the food for us to eat so we, we get to see the whole process hmm. and then it's, it's really different from just go to the market and buy it. it it connects you with some respect with the food you are eating but they have this, the same problem i don't know in the united states you have this company that they sell you the grains that they they can't uh, they, they, they can't if you plant them it's a sterile so if you yeah. buy a crop from them a, a whole um, crop and the next year you don't have seeds so you have to buy from them every year and in brazil things we do have the culture of having the seeds and then you have to, to plant and then you have the year and they are connected to the seasons and they have the celebrations of the, the plantation the the crop and everything they are more connected with the earth i think yeah. beautiful yeah no i I hope to get out hunting at some point. I, I feel bad as a meat eater. I need to I need to go through that whole process, you know, since I do eat so much meat. I want to go through that process of like the whole life cycle. I'm I, I really I'm not looking forward to it, but I feel like it would be good spiritually. And by spiritually I mean good on every level for me to go through that experience at least once, but preferably a few a few times just uh yeah i think gratitude is really important uh in in recognizing our own cycle and life and death i mean death's a crazy thing right we're all gonna fucking die you know yeah. some of us and the, the, there's the blood issue also when you killed an animal and that is this blood then and you see what you do it you have you to had, do this I, in, a, in a really respectful way yeah yeah i didn't really think about that much but i'm sure it'll i'm sure it'll be uh spiritually traumatic in a healthy way uh i'm a big believer in the importance of 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 the important role of trauma in our spiritual transformation i believe that trauma and transformation are intimately connected 
Um, this is the for our friend uh, who is on the podcast because you have live people, you have your uh, your your crew live listening on the podcast while it's recorded. I've been wondering if I should do that for my exclusive subscribers and let them be on live and listen like you do. Um, and then the, we had a big Q and A hangout afterwards, and everyone unveiled themselves, and you and me hung out with all your people for like an hour and a half after the podcast, just drinking yeah. scotch and talking shit, and that was really cool. So yeah, for anyone listening out there about podcasts to be on, um, this is a great podcast to be on. People should contact uh, Marcello here. Um, did I say your name right? Yes, it's, um, it's Marcelo, no. but the Italian Marcello. is Marcello. I fucked it up. See, I go, I keep, it's because I want to learn Italian. That's why I keep going that direction. I'm biased. Um, Marcelo. So, yeah. Um, the yeah. other thought I had, which, okay, I forgot. I hope I could say some, some stuff about Brazil, but it was, uh, when, I, when I say that, I probably when I'm listening to that, I say, oh, why did I say that? They, they won't believe me. No, no. Brazil, people... Brazil is so, so crazy. I think people might so believe almost anything right now. Out of this world. Yeah. That yeah. even for people who do magic, Brazil's real life is most, it's more crazy than magic. Yeah, yeah. you can't. It usually goes for some stuff in Twitter that you, you have to look at that and say, I don't believe I'm reading this. For, for instance, we had a, we will have a football championship in, in a few months, and we have the Supreme Court of our country to decide about the matches in football. I, I, I really don't believe that if there's any other country in the world where the Supreme Court would rule about the dates and if there will be a championship or, or not of soccer. Can, can you imagine the Supreme Court of Canada ruling a, a, about a, a soccer championship? Yeah, why did that happen? <laughs> it's because they're against the, the president and uh, Argentina didn't want to hold this uh, championship because of COVID. And then our president accepted it. But the, the point was that Pfizer uh, called him like... Uh, 20 times to offer uh, vaccines, and he didn't answer. But when uh, they called him about uh, soccer, he answered next day. Uh, this is the present we, we have. This is, this is the guy. So people are pissed out. But the vast majority of Brazilians, they like football and samba. Yeah. So they are saying that the communists are trying to... Um, trying to mess up with the football <laughs> Dear God. I, I told you brazil is not for the amateur brazil is not for the amateur welcome to brazil motherfuckers <laughs> you're gonna die no go to brazil it's a wonderful place just uh watch out it for is. the football brazil is, is a really wonderful place yeah uh, no i i look forward to despite of South all America. of this because well, if, you, if you come to Brazil, you will come as a tourist. And especially if you are from the occult and, and stuff and you get in contact with us, we will kind of protect yes. you and, and avoid you from, from taking you to the bad side of here. Yes, well, that, that's what for, I was For the, the normal people here, it is like hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. <sighs> I was yeah I was going to mention yeah one of your uh, fellows was very very keen to visit Canada and I, I I think you know I've met a lot of Brazilians of course in Vancouver uh, over my life that you, they're usually here studying English and you know I've done I've done a little teaching of that when I needed to and uh, those I always figured I always I always tried to imagine the Brazilians I taught uh, ESL to tried to imagine what their life was like there and. And how remarkable it must be that they could come here and live in a penthouse, you know? Yeah. So I met Brazilians living in a penthouse here that cost, I don't even know how much it would cost, mm -hmm. but I would, I would meet some of those and they're just here for six months or a year learning English. And I would get sent and by they're not to the, go the Brazilian house. Brazilians. Yeah. They're most like, uh, uh, well, 
uh, if, if you say I'm not a Brazilian Brazilian because I live in Sao Paulo and I have a house and everything, it is really a, a privilege here. Yeah. It is, a, unfortunately, it is a very poor country. Yeah. And since uh, we, we that have the opportunity to study magic and everything, you have to have some wealth, some, some money spared, uh, a comfort, food, a job, things like that. Otherwise, you won't study ceremonial magic. It's, it's not for uh, the, the people from Brazilia. No? They, they are mostly, I, I, I understand how they, they get gathered uh, in the church so much because they, they have nothing. There's nothing and else. And they are yeah. promised uh, yeah. miracles. I imagine the preacher was selling magic beans to cure COVID. Imagine how ignorant you have to be to believe something like that and well, gather and give the money you don't have. It clearly to, works. To parasite like this. It clearly works. And I've been complaining about stupid people for so long. Now I know what I need to do. I need to sell them magic beans. And then yes. I can stop complaining about them. Then I'll be like, I love you. Here's some beans. Uh, here's some beans. But they're, they're not uh, stupid. I believe oh the God. word is ignorant. It's different than stupid. Yeah, stupid no, no. Someone who, and, and desperate. If, if, I sell, if I sell magic beans to a Canadian, he would be stupid. Yeah. But if you, you sell magic beans to a poor Brazilian, he, is, he, he believes in things like that. There was a yeah. study here. I, I, I'm an architect, and I had um, a specialization in semiotics. And semiotics it, semiotics are you serious history of religion so in in these classes uh we had to watch the big brother show i i don't believe it, if there's it still happens in canada do you have the, the big brother tv show big brother uh you, you I, know I what i'm talking about i haven't it's, had it's, a, it's a house where you put some ordinary people and you have to vote uh, some of them to get out of the house uh, oh, it big. started all over the world about 20 years ago. They have yeah. like two or three seasons in, uh, in every country. And in Brazil, we have 20 seasons. And every year we have a big brother. And the dream of the young is to become a big brother. Yeah, big so brother is something to go very on different the show. here. Big brother, yeah. big brother to me, what big brother is in Canada is a program where uh, adult men uh, help young boys uh have like a father figure so that like i i knew some kids when i was young who oh had God. big brothers and they were part of the big brother program and it was like exactly. you know they don't have a dad or their dad's a deadbeat and they would have a big brother uh come and throw the football with them and take them out to do things um i always as a kid i thought it was very sad but then i lost my got us you know my dad divorced and my mom with my with my mom and and then i sort of lost him and all of a sudden i realized wow it would be really nice to have like someone in my life who would actually want to do that so that's what big brother very different than it is in brazil okay so it's you don't you different. don't have you if you, don't if have you google brother. if you google the big uh, the, the tv show big brother it's like that you get some some people and mostly if they, the guy is kind of crazy or are very beautiful women because they when they get out of the show they usually go to the playboy and pose yeah. nudes and very this sounds like an American thing. Yeah, this is American. Like yeah, this is the difference between Canada and America. In America, Big Brother is a show with sexy women and lots of money. In Canada, it's guys helping like <laughs> kids feel not alone. Yeah, no, I'm joking. For, for I'm joking. People in Brazil, the, the vast majority, they, they believe that when an artist go in the TV and say, oh, I use... Uh, this product in my my hair because it's very nice. They they really believe that a multimillionaire artist would use a ten dollar product in his hair or her hair. Yeah, and they don't know it is a, it's a, an advertise. They think it's a is is an is an advice. All right. <laughs> so t TV in Brazil is more like this. It is a lot of uh, game shows and things to distract you. And football, and uh, we have soap operas. 
they're, they're not like the American soap operas. Uh, you have TV series né, from Netflix that have 20 episodes, etc. In Brazil, uh, the soap operas have uh, one hour each episode, and it's like 200, 300 episodes. Yeah. So you yeah. have to watch it every day for like six months. You guys are hardcore. Uh, really hardcore. You take your human drama seriously. <laughs> I want tears and death. Tears and death. And the actors who who play the bad guys in, in this soap operas, they got beaten up by old ladies in the street. <laughs> Why? Because they, they think that he's a bad guy. <laughs> oh, no. It the happens. Old ladies, it happens. The old ladies watching their stories think it's real, and so they attack yes. the stars. <laughs> he's like, I'm an actor, I'm an actor. Oh, my God. <laughs> that would... <laughs> It's funny. It's, it's like living in a medieval times. <laughs> Marcelo, you shouldn't have cheated on Debio. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God, that's so hilarious. I think my uh, I think my THC is kicking in. Um, yeah. I don't. You know, it's so hard. I I, I always feel so challenged to talk about, um, like. You know, when we're living in being a Canadian you always feel like you're sort of lucky but at the same time you feel sort of powerless to do anything you know like so our lifestyle here is one of the best on the planets for sure even if you're poor there's like in vancouver people will ask you for money for food all the time like like non-stop but if you live here you know that there's never a shortage of food they can get food there's no lack of food they, they don't really want food, you know, um, because there's no way you could not get plenty of food anytime you want. Easy. It's very easy to do. Not necessarily good food. Um, and uh, you might have to like sing a few prayers in a, in a, in the church or whatever, but you, you know, that's not real poverty. We're talking about starvation, right? We're talking about starvation. I just watched, um, this North Korean lady who's written books, she just did an interview with, uh, with, with Jordan Peterson here in Canada. I, I just watched most of it. It was like two hours and it's like harrowing what she went through to survive North Korea. Then she was a sex slave in China before she got to South Korea and went to Columbia University for her last year of undergrad. What a crazy thing. She was saying how like they, they, they took words like stress out of the their language in north korea because if you don't have a word for something you can't define it right they take our words they take our ability to describe what we're even experiencing like she said she spent most of her life roasting dragonflies as a kid with a lighter to eat and that's how they got their protein they would run in the fields and catch dragonflies and roast them with a lighter and that was their main food and she said she weighed like 50 pounds most up until she was like 13 you know, or, or something like that. It was, it, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's hard to imagine how we can do anything as individual people. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, this powerlessness leads back to magic in a weird way because magic's always been there. And like you said, it's even used by the powerful to protect themselves. And maybe those of us who want to disrupt what the direction the world is going need to take more seriously our ability to act on that level sometimes i i wonder this it's a it's a serious thing you know do you ever think about that uh, yes a lot we uh in our masonic lodges here are, we do a lot of this kind of uh, um, charity so we gather all, all our brothers and we raise food now here we have an internet we, we change uh, we say, uh, I don't believe you have a word for that. We said the cesta basica, that is a, is a, it's a, it's a basic box that uh, the government gives to very poor people that has food, uh, basic food for them to last a month. Hmm. And we call it the, the cesta basica. And we change uh, uh, birth charts and uh, astrology readings from 
for cestas básicas to, to distribute to the very poor. And we had a lot of programs like this to, together. Um, we have uh, festivals or, or sometimes ceremonies when you pay a fee and then we gather all this money and then we go to an orphanage or, or some, some hospital that's in need of basic supplies. But it's mostly like it's what we call it's uh, ants work. I don't know if you have this expression. A trabalho de formiguinha is, is an ant's work because it's an ant and he can carry just a leaf and then go, go, go. And then he goes back to the, the ant peaks. And it's a very small and very individual uh, effort, I believe. This is kind of complicated. Uh, yeah, 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 no, I get it. that's a that's an interesting way to see things you know um we do we do have a lot of artists that they, they came from the the poor that they usually help back this is something that is happening and in the pandemic here uh, because when you say about the pandemic and you are in the united states of canada or canada you you can't believe how it is to have this kind of pandemic here in the third world. And I, I, I believe I cannot understand how it sh should be going in India, for example, that they're having ten, tens of thousands of people killing every day. But here in Brazil, we got to, to some points that we had like uh, uh, three, 4,000 people killed every day because we don't have uh, nice hospitals yeah. uh, and... Uh, normally the hospitals are full and they are overpopulated and in the pandemic people were dying in their houses and uh, since yeah. this, this government had something with the Invermectina and then and some drugs that the chloroquina and stuff that, that does not work but the, the army had made a tons of them so he had to, to shovel up our asses and he, the president starts um, advertising drugs that do not work because of political interests and people who are defending that and, and even going to the, the, um, the public and saying there's no virus, there's nothing happened here. Oh. And so we have a part of our population that, uh, that, that do not believe the virus and they have, ah, you have to stay off in home because of the communists and they want us to lose our jobs and we have restaurants that are, are getting broken and shops and, and everything like that. So th this time is this particularly 2020 and now this year has been a, a very serious, uh, I believe it was like, like a probationist test for everyone here. Yeah. <clears throat> it's very different. I don't know if you get this kind of news. Up oh God, no. um, I like mean. That. Yeah, no, the uh, the amount of news control going on right now in Canada and America is, I believe, almost unprecedented. I believe in the early days of the newspaper, uh, there was maybe more control over information because they were just owned by a few wealthy individuals and families. But now, and then, then we had an opening up of information throughout the 20th century as, as more and more people like with the independent uh, newspapers that, that's, that sprung up and leading to the internet. But now we're seeing all of that, that crush down again. And we're seeing restriction of information. Like I go on, I open up my YouTube. Do you see, is there a clicking happening? Do you hear a clicking? Okay. Uh, I open up my YouTube and it mostly only shows me videos I've already seen. What is that? Like, you know, I'm paying 20 bucks a month for this thing and it's just showing me what I've already seen. And I can see how it's controlling what I see. It's like, this is scary. Like I, I have to, you know, I pull back more and more from the information stream coming at me. Uh, but it's worrisome because we don't get accurate information at all. Like, I mean, most, most I'd say most Canadians and Americans don't believe, I think, Maybe they do, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, that they don't believe that they have much, that their our countries do much uh, to perpetuate the problems in South America, right? But they do. I mean, 
uh, everything from like the the drug industry and the CIA to you know Canada's role in uh, you know destabilizing governments, which it it helps the U.S. right. Um, but people, we don't hear that much about what happens here. I've I've worked with uh, other clergy who have been stationed down in in countries in South America, and you know, it it we feel so powerless. Like, you know, but we feel powerless to change our own country as well. Like we're locked into these political systems. There's no options. It doesn't matter who you vote for. It's the game's over. It feels like if, and you know. And if your if your chips were good, if your family did was doing well, then you're going to be maybe okay. But if not, you're fucked. It's game over. So what do you do when the whole world around you is telling you that it's game over? Now up here, it's true. Like you can work hard and sort of try and improve your life, right? You can. Yeah. You can make a business and 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 work hard and try and improve your life. But as far as changing the mechanisms of how everything works, that's where I think most people feel really powerless. You know, uh, I believe illiteracy is one of the most uh, one of the things that strikes your power the most. Uh, when I when I travel, so you to have Egypt, a problem with literacy in Brazil. We do have a serious problem with literacy. You know, so now, WhatsApp. You now have I'm WhatsApp thinking, and Telegram. Now in Brazil, thinking, we. Uh, we People use it uh, to get to get voice mail. Uh, you know, you write on Telegram or stuff, or you can just use for voice. The majority of people here in Brazil use it for voice because they can't read. That that's how problematic it is. And I, I think illiteracy, since magic is the came from the word imago, imaging, image. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know how to read, you don't can't have imagination and you cannot perceive the world around you. And I discovered that when, when we traveled to Egypt, there was a time when we went to, to a, a village and to a market over there. And then we spent the afternoon wandering around in the market. But there, there's nothing in English there. There's nothing in anything. Everything is in, in Arab, Arab. So when you look at the store and you see everything in Arab, and you cannot understand what is that herb, that product, that that is just uh, some, some magical traces, and you do not know and perceive the world around you. I, I feel that's powerless. Yeah, I believe that's the worst feeling in the world. And yeah, if you are in the market, you, because you can't fake illiteracy, you can't no, pretend yeah. that you cannot write, read. But in this, this particular experience, <laughs> no, it's impossible. You can't fake <laughs> that you, you, you can't read. But at that point, <laughs> when we wonder about two hours in the market and we, you look at stuff and you, you just, you cannot even understand the words because if, if you go to Brazil and you say everything in Portuguese, you still can identify the letters. No. But if you go to China or India, or somewhere where you cannot even figure out what it's written. That's true illiteracy. And that is a feeling so crushing, so devious. I believe that's one of the, the, the worst feelings I've, I've ever felt in my life. It's, to, it's like you're powerless. You depend on, on other people to say things to you so that you can comprehend the world around you yeah and to be like that in your just to be illiterate in your whole environment so and to be illiterate in your own country yeah that you you went in the streets and you, you can uh well this is the 21st century my my wife uh she had a friend here that there's a woman who cleans their apartment and she couldn't read she was like a 40, 40 something years, and she didn't know how to read. And then the kids here, they, they, they're not reading because the teachers, they are just faking that they teach and the, the, the kids don't want to study and they just want to TikTok and YouTube and, and, they, and you cannot fail. 
If you go to school, you cannot fail. If you have the, the grade to pass the grade, you cannot uh, fail. You have to pass. Mm. Because they had to show, um, politically speaking, that they, they have to show productivity. So they implemented this stuff that uh, you go to school and you cannot uh, fail. So even if you don't know anything, the teacher has to pass you. So these guys get to college and they don't know how to read. Or if they read something, they cannot understand what they, they just read. And as magicians and that we dealt on books and things like that. Yeah. Um, even the rich people here in Brazil, uh, just to say how, how terrible these things are. In cinemas here, we do not have the option of subtitles anymore. Because the, the uh, wealthy expensive. people in Brazil cannot read two hours of subtitles mm. so they had to put everything translated and okay cinemas so, yeah. and tv and everything most of the, the videos and films and everything we consume is from the united states yeah so you believe that would be an option to go to the movies and, and see the original sound but it. you don't anymore we don't have it anymore. Yeah, and it's and it's a it's, commercial thing. It's a commercial. Yeah, thing. and it's been proven that that having those uh, the subtitles with the original language increases uh, linguistic diversity. Right, the Sweden, for example, yes. always had subtitles. But when I was in uh, Österreich in in and in, in Germany, it was always um, overdub with German. You know, so I would see Brad Pitt with a German voice, and I. It was very hard to find the originals with subtitles, very hard to find that. And Sweden, all my Swedish friends, though, back in the 90s, they spoke much better English than my German and Austrian friends because they had the original languages in their cinemas. So that's that's here's here's the idea. Here's a magical idea for your brother. So. Stephen Skinner's just released how to actually do the Ars Notaria, and I haven't got it, of course, yet. He's just released this this work and talked about it. But it sounds like magically, maybe, assuming this stuff works and all this magic thing is in a bunch of mumbo jumbo, maybe there's a version of ritual from the Ars Notaria, which is about learning, accelerated learning, that could be done to impact the, you know, illiterate in Brazil, you know, and that's a kind of ritual that could be even maybe done by magicians all over the world, because what the Ars Notoria is good at helping people do apparently is learn new things they haven't learned before really quickly and I've been in learning environments that were so good that you learned very complicated things quickly and I've been in learning environments where you know it's it's often about the quality of the teacher and and the environment um, but also there's being in the right sort of mental place and that's where I think that magic can actually do something and so like a kind of ritual that magicians could feed into Tommy Kelly style all the time around the world to increase literacy in, amongst not just Brazil, but any population that needs literacy to fight back and to stand up for their own dignity. That's an idea. I'm just thinking, man. This is the first step. If you talk about the, the Clifford and the Tree of Death, Let's talk about the Clipo. Uh, we, well, Brazil is, is a huge example of the, the Tree of Death. It's Brazil here, so. is an example of the Tree of Death <laughs> incarnated. Okay, okay, we're into the weeds. So now. we do have the Tree of Life, and uh, I consider the, the Tree of Death uh, not below the Tree of Life. Then we have some authors that they put the Tree of Life, and then they, they put the Clifford as the roots of the life. I believe that the tree of life and the tree of death, they are the same tree. Because uh, what the, the free will is what drives you to one side of the other. Uh, imagine, for example, Hod and Samael. Very easy to, under, to, to understand. How this knowledge, how this is the words, um, the forms and everything that you, that you know, the book, a dictionary would be Hod. And Samael is lie, it's lies and media. And then if you are using these words to, to tell lies to people, to, to fool them or to rob them or to, to falsify things, 
but they are the same thing. If you have a person that is a very good at manipulating words, he can become a good writer or a good forger. It's up to, to his free will. Yeah. So the tree of life and the tree of death are merely two sides of the same coin. And then you can put this idea and, and use it to the whole tree of life. So whatever there is a path, there's a tunnel. But they're the same. It's just that energy that is used uh, through free will to do uh, things that are good or things that are bad. And good and bad are terms that I, I don't like a lot to use. Because if you're a lion and you go there and kill uh, uh, an animal to eat, for the 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 kid, you know, the, the the animal kid, it would be a bad thing. But to the lion kid, it would be a good thing. But I, I would like to say that the tree of life would be a path through enlightenment, to to live in, and when we all live together and each one helps each other to achieve a higher ground. And in the tree of death, through free will, is like when you have someone that uses the other ones as a vampire. So it would be like mostly altruist and egoist use of the yeah. tree. And the tree is a tree. So I, I studied the tree like that. And you can get uh, examples from the tree of life through the tree of death. And if you get, uh, that's why I'm, I'm telling you this. Uh, if you had the path of Tav, this is the, the first one when you leave Malkut to Yesod. So yes, so this imagination is astral projection and uh, symbols and the dead and dreams and everything like that. And Tav, it would be the, the, the bridge between the physical world and the spiritual world. And you connected this path, pathwork through meditation and imagination and the rituals and things that explore this kind of imagination in the human being. But the Tantifax Sax, that's the tunnel. Tantifax Sax. Tantifax Sax. Tantifax Sax. I have it would be, spent some time with that fellow. <laughs> it would be the gates at the, no, what in Brazil they say, uh, os jardins do. Oh, I forgot the word. Ja, é, os portões do Jardim do Eden. The Eden's uh, gate. It's like a gate that you have the, the Gardens of Eden. The Gardens of Eden's gate is that you can see the Gardens of Eden, but you can't go there. So every sect, every uh, bad religion, every um, cult, the first thing they start telling you is that you cannot read anything but what is approved by the cult. So if you join the church, for example, they say you cannot read Harry Potter, it's from the devil, you can only read what I give you. So this sh shut up in many ways is the opposite of Tav, that is go study a lot, go find the word, go see everything, go get amazed, that, that's Tav. Get amazed, I like that. Get amazed, then go see the word, go find things, learn. And the backwards, the, the tree of death, it's like, do not go see things. Do not get amazed. Do what I tell you. And this is the tunnel. This is what you have to, to fight. But if you think about that, you, you can do this exercise to all the paths. And it's, it's wonderful and it's frightening. Because you see that there's no life, tree of life and tree of death. There's only a tree. And you choose to, to go to one side or the other. No, you choose, choose anyone, any path that you want, and we can we talk about. You see that you can, they're the same. They're just the same energy that I use it in an altruistic way or an egoistic way. If you say, okay. let, let's get others. For example, um, Kaf. Kaf. Uh, yeah, tell me a path, any any letter. For, for, for the... You for the tree of life, the and tree. then we can discuss the tree of death. Let's talk about. So I prove to you, Sadi. What? Sadi. 
All right, it's Sadiq. Crowley say that the Sadiq is not the star, man, but in the Golden Dawn, Sadiq connects. Yeah, yes, I, what, sorry, what I can't hear you. What did Crowley say? He um, said Sadiq is not the star. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not <laughs> yeah. But yeah, from Cro the Golden Crowley Dawn messed with my favorite view. path. I have no, I no, will I always if I ever if I ever run across Alistair Crowley, I'm gonna smack him for fucking with my favorite <laughs> path. Man, don't fuck with Aquarius, man. Yeah. And certainly and don't you, tell Aquarius that you know the right placement for it. They just won't <laughs> like no. Tell that to a Gemini, they'll be like, Oh yeah, okay, that's cool. You can move me onto this other path. Don't tell that to Aquarius. Anyway, so let's talk about Sadi. Sadi and the, the tunnel. That's correspondent to Tsadi is Tsufli Fu. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, you can get it any, any I mean, book. I, I literally, Ref, I have a book. Rafli Fu on is it. from Resh. Yeah. Rafli Fu is the tunnel from Resh. Yeah. And Tsufli Fu is the tunnel from Tsadi. And it connects Yezod to Netza. So Yezod is imagination, the spirits and everything like that. And Netza is the emotions. So when you connect this two, you have Tzadik that is in truly inspiration and art. It's when you, you get your insight, you know, your intuition connected with the worldly emotion. So we can get done the most beautiful art ever. And this is truly, Tzadik is truly the, the, the beauty path. I can see why you, you like it most. I like it a lot too. It's a truly inspirational one. And the yeah. other side, it's Sufli Flu, is what we call to the bad art, the generation of art, it's the putrid, things that wants to corrupt the human being. Because it gets from where to where. It goes from um, it goes from the, the two words. I always forget the names. It's not the, the, the opposite of Nitzak. It's all as all Arab Zarak. Yeah, they are the, the ravens the of death. The crows. The right? ravens are the crows of death. Yeah, and they lead the up crows, to, to Giron. Yes, to And uh, these crows, they are the opposite of Netza. Since Netza is the yeah. beauty, the virgin, the, the this these birds, they they are always shouting and, and like ripping the human being apart. Say like one of the crows say. Oh, you can have sex, 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 everything wrong, drugs. And the other birds will say, no, no, you can't. It's a sin. It's a sin. You can't do that. So the human being that is among these two crows is torn apart. And it's kind of the hypocrisy of society. And you yeah. say you can do any free and then we'll punish you for everything. And it's the opposite of Netza that's supposed to be the muse. Dude, dude, I'm sending you my little book on this. I'm going to send you my little book on this because I, I broke it. I looked at it. I looked at the, I used the tunnels and the clipothic tree to understand some of the uh, spiritual journey through the seven deadly sins. And uh, in, in contrast, so I looked at, if you're going through these journeys, what's some good advice? And for the good advice, I drew directly from St. John of the Cross who talks about how to deal with these sins in his dark night of the soul, particularly the first half where he covers them in the dark night of the spirit. And yeah, so I looked at, I used those as my guide through those workings and I'll send you that. You've got to send me your address and stuff. And I'll, yeah, I'm curious to see what you think. I've got a new version of it coming out. That's much updated because I put it out in like 1999 and did workshops uh, in the Golden Dawn on it, but it's it's I've I've got a better understanding now, and and of course of we've talked about the work I want to do on the Sefer Karnaim, um, so hopefully we'll we'll talk more about that because there's definitely some publishers interested in getting that Sefer Karnaim out to the public, and I all of us are very in, interested with the new uh, with the release of Moshe Adele's new book on understanding primeval evil in the Kabbalah. Um, which right now, for some reason, I think it's due to an error. You can get it through Amazon.com and it's for like $2. It's a hardcover book like this thick and it's $2 in America only plus shipping. Oh. So you can order it. Check it out. If you, if you buy that book in Canada, it's $40 plus mm -hmm. shipping. So it's like a, a, some sort of weird thing that's going on with this Moshe Adele book. I don't know if the price has gone up now, but 
either way, it's the first serious academic look at the history of evil, the, the problem of theodicy, as we say in theology, theodicy, the question of evil. And he looks at it. And for a scholar like that to finally look at the Kleepot is very, very exciting because this is one of the finest minds in the world. He's the protege of, you know, Gershom Sholem. You know, this is this guy. I don't know if you've read Adele. I know I talked to your buddy a lot about it. And he was like, whoa, those books are crazy expensive. I'm like, yeah, they're crazy expensive um, <laughs> to get his works. But except for this new one, which accidentally is priced really low. Um, but to understand evil as part of the body of God, that evil is not created as an antagonistic force as Luciferians or Satanists. Some might might say that again. I don't speak for them. Um, and they're as varied as they are as the Christians or pagans are. But I do think there's a really important lesson to be learned in, in this, in this kind of shadow work of seeing our, our selves clearer, more honestly, and also seeing our true will in contrast to the true darkness that it could be. That, that, that's the main lesson you get from studying the cliff author is that you can, hold the, the real dark side that you can get to, and then you, you will truly uh, give the, the right value to the virtue. What it did for that, me is it helped, it helped me become a better person. Because yes, when you I have was to understand doing the worst the, that you can do. Yeah, I would even see glimpses of how things that I didn't understand could, could impact people evilly, um, you know, uh, when I was very young, when I was a teenager, like I was very powerless uh, compared to the bullies around me, you know, um, for me, I was very bullied. And, and as a result, I didn't really understand, understanding how that the, the root of that kind of cruelty, um, I couldn't understand how it could be in me because I was so mistreated by other people but when i did understand where it existed in me all of a sudden i found it was i was l treated less badly by other people by seeing where my own malevolence could be found you know and and that was powerful it was it was literally like spiritual revelations changed how people treated me and that's that's talking about more of the theurgic aspect of magic which i know is not very popular these days um with everyone summoning spirits but i like you and especially i know uh, you know the idea of masonry to make good men better um is very important the idea that like it doesn't really matter from in one perspective what what we do while we're alive we're all going to die right so how what's our legacy to ourselves going to be are we are we going to have understood ourselves as best as we can, knowing thyself, and and really want to meet our end with his, not just not just a clear conscience, but with the sense that we've valiantly stood up, and and shouted and screamed in the face of the darkness that we just won't go quietly. Let's quote. Let's get back to the poetry. We won't go quietly into that dark night. You know, we're gonna rage. We're going to rage and and we are in positions now and globally as, as human beings where we have sat back for so long and let the assholes run the world because we were too busy, like with our books or our games or whatever else. And now we're like, oh, shit, now we're in trouble and we have to do something. And a lot of us feel powerless. So what can we do? And we can know ourselves and maybe summon some powerful spirits along the way know ourselves i believe it is it's hard enough <laughs> yeah it is like the the ants word uh last week i i had one of my readers he's a, a an actor in brazil a very famous one and he has like eight thousand uh 800 000 followers in instagram and he, and he got so uh, delighted by the kabbalah and now we are having a podcast with him, so uh, we can teach the the really, really, really basic to the people who who got him from the the novel, the the, the TV show. 
and uh, he he wanted he put money he paid for everything we are recording like 10 episodes and we're going through his instagram and it was like he, he had 30,000 views and he say oh it is very very low but it's okay because it's a personal thing <laughs> and i said 30,000 viewers 30,000 listeners is a very low stuff and say okay but if we can uh, sparkle like one of this 30,000 it's a job. So I, I believe it's like that. You do what you can. And, and if the, there's the, this guy is prepared, the synchronicity will take you to, either to your podcast or to mine. And the most we get to, to talk, to, to, to broadcast our ideas, I believe that you have a better chance to, 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 to see that there's a, some I can't remember. There's something in the Bible that says that you have to see the the, the, the crops. Not everyone, not, not everything, will bear fruit, but some will, and stuff like that. And I believe that that's what we can do. And if uh, the, the more power we get, the, the more people we can uh, achieve. Yeah. But uh, sometimes we, we wonder about that, and uh, we ask it. For example, if you we. I don't know in Canada, it's TV. here in Brazil, we have the, the TV and it is still very uh, important to people that they watch the regular TV. TV. Yeah. Yes. TV, yeah, no, TV, like the, the old stuff TV. I, I don't know and, anyone uh, that really has watched and stuff. TV in a long time. And now we have uh, a lot of the population, they, they just have that and they, they just watch, it's called TV Global. It's like the, the true Orwell Big Brother here. This is like it shapes our reality here. This, yeah. this channel. Yeah. Uh, it's like it's not like Fox in the United States. I, I, it couldn't compare because the global is so huge. Uh, it literally, it shapes our reality here in Brazil. And if we can, uh, just if you could hack that and then explain about the Kabbalah and then people would be forced to listen, they wouldn't understand it. So. We feel we feel a lot like the, the Neo in the Matrix, that you know the truth and you look around, oh, yeah. and say, "Oh man, this is television. This is ads. Oh my God, this is the cliff art. <laughs> and you know what it is, and you know you can't do anything about it. So you have to fight like one man at a time. I mean, Matrix. I think it's my favorite movie. It's amazing. The first one. Yeah. You know, I was taken to see I that. I feel like that. You, you get out of the, the reality and say, oh, this is very worse. I went to the steak. Yeah. Take me back. Then give me the, the hot steak. Man, I was taken to see that movie, The Matrix, when it first came out. Um, and uh, in, when I was in L.A. And I was there in grade 12 going through going through my portal initiation and testing. And so the, the night I was taken was by Ramsey's and like the the chief adepts in the golden dawn down in la took took me and the other my friends the other candidates who were there like edward of uh esoteric nerd podcast uh very popular very honor fatter bt esoteric nerd podcast who's up and active again doing podcasts go edward he lives in india now but he so we went to see the matrix at the same time we were going through this portal initiation into in in leaving the golden dawn essentially like finishing that work it was a very powerful experience and that was the experience of reality and it still is to this day that this is there's a veil that we don't see through and it and it's on every level and uh i don't know so maybe before since we're talking about the veil of reality uh before we say farewell because i know it, it was 11 p.m. at night when we started this podcast. Yes, it was it seven for, and now it's it like so super nice. late. It's almost 2 o'clock. Almost 2 a.m. for you. Well, you're a hardcore motherfucker. I love you, man. And, <laughs> and definitely when you want to put come on the podcast again, and this goes to everyone who I've ever interviewed, let me know. Because I've gotten a lot more busy with teaching. And, and I've also been hired now to translate a 300-year-old manuscript finally. So I've got other work that's like, you want to look, come on the podcast, let me know, reach out, sit, tell me like, yo, I want to come Great. talk. I, I will you. do it. Brazilian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, let's and, have and your think about that, that stuff and putting your, your supporters to watch 
the the talk and recording and ask questions it is really nice and they, they really like that i think that's what i'm going to start doing is inviting for every interview i do i'll invite the people who are exclusive subscribers to my podcast to to come on the interview and send them the zoom link so yeah um that's probably a good idea so shout out if you guys want to join on my uh, exclusive membership go to hermeticpodcast.com magicwithoutfears.com you can go through that it's just a couple bucks to and then i'll invite you to be on the interviews live from now on um because that that sounds like it worked for us it worked for what you're doing and if that would be something people enjoyed which apparently they do then i'm happy to do that um definitely doesn't doesn't bother me and if it, it might mean for like some very exclusive hangouts with the guests afterward right because we did we had an hour and a half hangout and talked about crazy shit that wouldn't and it wasn't recorded it wasn't recorded at all it was just like yeah we, we yo, do that with every guest that's every why guest. that's why the secret to life is just showing up right if you show up you get the candy um <laughs> so i'll do that but so like before i let you go to bed and i know your wife's probably waiting um we talked about the veil and the matrix entheogens psychedelics um this plant substances that exist that have a spiritual reality or somehow trigger us to see other realities what's your experience with that stuff with all of it from from, 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 the, from the sacrament of cannabis sativa or indica <laughs> and those sacramental uh herbs the herb dangerous all, right. all the way through up to ayahuasca or dmt like let's talk about that as much as we all can right. before you uh fall asleep you look awake. Okay, so, <laughs> well, first of all, I have to say that all, all the things that you have said, they're forbidden here in Brazil. And oh, you can get arrested yeah. and you can so you get... have no experience. So I stuff. don't have any experience, but I have a friend that had... You had a, a friend of that had experience, and, and like I will that? talk about okay. this friend. Yeah, yeah. This friend yeah. of mine who who had. Yeah. Then I don't 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 talk to him anymore, and I, I lost contact with him. Yeah. So I just talk about the old days and this friend of mine experience. And he left stuff. you his magical diaries, all of his yeah. diaries. So you have. Yes, yeah, so I read. I had a, a lot yeah. of uh, yeah. interesting information, but I, I don't know where he lives anymore his name is he probably lives in canada now. <laughs> probably but i i believe intelligence are great for the the, the ones that truly uh, try to connect this path uh, i know this experience of having the lcd and we call here bala i don't know what is in english it's thc bala uh, as Bala, Molly, uh, my wife would know what the, the specific chemics of that. But you have this experience when you have Bala. this, this, Bala. this intelligence, and then it's Bala is candy in Portuguese. It's THC candy. Yeah. And uh, you lay down or you go to a, ca a cave and you are let there in the total darkness and you spend the whole night in the, the complete darkness. And then I believe you, you get out of your body and you experience the, the real astral traveling. Because mm -hmm. have you ever been to a cave and then turn off all the lights there? And it's dark, it is completely dark, but, but it's not black. It's a kind of a gray and you cannot see anything. You, you hold your hand like 10 centimeters. Uh, you, you don't know what centimeters, no Canadian knows. <laughs> like uh, 20 centimeters from your, your face <laughs> and you cannot see your hand and you cannot see anything and then at that time you, you float away from your body and you truly experience some, something astral like that uh, I have uh, experimented ayahuasca that's legal here uh, as long as you do in a religious ceremony and for me, it was a great experience. I, I had all these books. You have seen the, the, the books that I've wrote on, on Kabbalah and stuff and mythology. And before that, I was like a, a bookworm that you read, read, read everything on Campbell and stuff and all this. And when I had the ayahuasca, I saw myself climbing up uh, like a ladder, a giant ladder with all the gods, they were sitting there, like in televisions or, or screens 
or paintings or everything. And it was like a living uh, tree of life with the path and the true uh, from Malkut to Keter. And then I was wandering in this path. And then I could see all this, this uh, similarities between all cul cultures and gods and everything that Campbell would have discovered if he took ayahuasca or, or if he studied Kabbalah and the, the, this, the Golden Dawn. And then we can see that it is all connected, but in the truly sense of the, the Alma Mundi sense, it was through the, 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 the heart of the world and you know, the spirit of the world and gods and stories and even superheroes and cartoon characters and they are all connected. They're, they're all part of this huge maze with their images going on about. And then I came back from this trip I, I began writing. I began writing the, that book, the, the uh, Hermetic Kabbalah. That's all in Portuguese. I, have, I would love to publish it in English someday, but it's a, a huge book. Do people, read, a lot of... do people read your uh, Portuguese books in Portugal? Yes. Yeah. In Brazil, do you ever talk in Portugal. To, do you ever talk to uh, people in Portugal on your podcast? Oh uh, yes, they they listen to my podcast. Yeah. Uh, oh, in, in if you you're in United States or Canada, you can uh, li, uh, watch them in YouTube because we put subtitles in every everyone, even the Portuguese, and then you can put translate to English. Yeah. So you can watch a lecture about King Banda or Umbanda, Candomblé, uh, the Freemason in Brazil, anything you want. Uh, yeah, there's, you, there are subtitles in every video. So you, if you, you are interested, really, you do really outstanding work. That's one of the reasons I I message you on Telegram to say like, look, let, let's let's get you on my podcast soon because I I think people there's a lot of really good work that you're doing and you're an amazing person uh, in general. Like the between the board games and the books and and all of that. That's fucking awesome. And uh, I, I hope that more people will, yeah, pay attention to Project Mayhem. I mean, come on. It's a, named after Fight Club, more or less. Let's, 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 like, that's, that's about, uh, it's like, you know, it's, it's the spiritual Fight Club. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not a fan of, like, that whole uh, shit disturbing going on with uh, the riots of Antifa and stuff like that. But I, I can't pretend I don't understand where it's coming from. I completely understand where it's coming from. You know what I mean? Like, yes. like people who say, oh, no, we weren't, we, we weren't helping Trump. We weren't helping. We just want to burn it all down. Like, of course, that's what you get. Like, that's, that's what, what you get. get. Like, how can anyone actually be surprised that that is where we're at? Of course, that's where we're at. And if we don't yes. want to deal with that, we've got another problem on our hands. So the politicization is really absurd because when you have people who just, you know, the people in the States are getting government support to burn it all down. The, the government's funding them burning it all down. And now, of course, you're not from the States, so you understand that America has been supporting people burning down their governments for, in their cities <laughs> for a very long time. This is nothing new, right? You know, in Canada's there in the background, like sending troops or money or whatever the fuck, music, you know. We, we're, we're, we're blasting Nickelback on the radio. We're like, never made it as a wise man. Couldn't cut it as a poor man's feeling, you know. Shit, I just realized my episode just got demonetized because I sang that. They demonetized me the second <laughs> I sing anything. Uh, well, too late now. And this mm. is how you remind... Sing with me. Me, uh, what I... I really don't, don't know Nickelback. You know, was... you know, no. I'm, I'm very it's glad terrible. you don't know Nickelback. <laughs> so, so ayahuasca is legal there as long as you do it in ceremonies. Yes. Yeah, so have... when, ex when you were experiencing right. ayahuasca, did you have a sense like you were physically in the astral plane? What, were you standing up and walking around with your eyes open? Yes, if your eyes were open, we and what did, seated. What did, what did you see with your eyes open on ayahuasca at the most? It is like, it's like a memory. It's like a living memory. You do not properly see it. But uh, for example, you are in your room 
And if you close your eyes, you can see everything. For example, now I know that there's a board game over here and a book over there and etc. but I'm not looking at it. So the memory stays real. So you don't, you don't have a visual uh, hallucination. It's more like a, a very vivid memory. But when you close your eyes uh, to your mind, it's like it's real. I don't know if I can I could very explain it. Yeah. Uh, it's very, not I, a visual hallucination from ayahuasca. Okay. But it's like a memory that, that got so vivid that you can swear it's true. So uh, when I was walking down that alley, I could remember if I was walking and I got tired and the feeling of having each step and the, the muscles in my neck as I turned my head to look at the statues and, and images and everything. And you have all the muscular remembering, all the muscular memory, all the, the visual memory and everything that I was like uh, really in that spot. It was different from the the, uh, the bala and the, the cave. That uh, it was a really a vision, astral vision, that I really get out of the body and then go to the stars and you, you look at the entities and you can, could talk to the entities and then you return to your body, you see your body there and then you open your eyes and you don't see anything and you're still in the cave and everything is... is, is uh, all your senses are so enhanced when you, you get from this experience that you feel alive. I believe that was the, the pharaoh experience that it, when you're uh, put into a tomb and sealed down and you get yeah. uh, sensory deprivation and plus uh, entheogenics. Hmm. That, that's very great too. And uh, the, the ayahuasca was... Uh, a very remarkable experience too because of that it was just like being there i used it sometimes and then the girl that that made the the tea for us she moved to acre the acre is like a, the other part of brazil oh. so it's too far away and i, I never used it anymore <laughs> but <coughs> yeah it's so it's very different yeah no i haven't done it but i really have to try have to try it's very different from pure dmt or changa yeah um which no, is they, much, they're much, very very yeah. different they're yeah very different all right shall we uh okay wrap up maybe well, what time thank is it? you so much i don't know it's almost two well it's almost thank two. you so much and I would like to say that if you want to, to uh, well, if you want to come to Brazil, you have where to stay. I'll take you to all the cool places. I, I would a, love to. You're talking the wrong guy. Trip. Here, here in Canada, <laughs> they're going to lock us down for another year. I think we're like we're like on lockdown forever. I think Trudeau has announced it to like 2024. I don't know what's going to happen, but, uh, you know, I think, I think maybe if I get vaccinated, they'll let me travel. Who knows? I just don't want to take yeah. a vaccine for a disease I've already had. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? It's crazy stuff, but uh, I'll, I'll, and... I'll, I'll follow my doctor's advice is what I'll keep doing. I've got a family doctor and I tend to trust my doctor a little bit, a little bit. And for your listeners, if you want to, to, Go check it. It's uh, youtube.com barra del debut. And then you can put it on somewhere in the description. Yeah, yeah. We'll and they it. can, we have over 190 interviews. And it's nice if you yeah. want to, to see how the, occult, how the occult scene in Brazil. And I have talked to, I talked to Aaron Leach, I talked to Lomilo, and some of the, the American uh, Authors too, and they're very nice. Well, but they if are you want very to, nice. to listen to, they're very nice. I think a lot of Brazilian people are interested authors, to hear they, they have Brazilian. subtitles. So, yeah, no, I think people are more interested uh, to expand their understanding with uh, authors in other parts of the world and practitioners who are who are practicing in parts of the world where practicing is very different. Um, you know, uh, you have maybe more restrictions, but in some ways also more options. Yeah. 
And we you have know. a lot about this, this uh, experience that we can do with the spirituality, with our, our spiritual guides through possession and, and corporation and things like that. Incorporation is a word in English. We, yes. we call it the incorporação here. Uh, yeah. So it seems like a, a, an industry stuff, but it's not. It's, it's a possession where the medium uh, is still awake and he can uh, talk with the spirit in his own head. This is very nice stuff. That's, it yeah, happens yeah. a lot here. It is it's less powerful than possession. And in voodoo, Santeria, we have the possession that the medium blacks out and the entity takes full control yeah. of his body. Mounting. In Umbanda, in Umbanda, we had some things that they, they take half control of your body, but you're still uh, seeing and listening and you can think and talk to the entity. And this, these are very nice stuff. And I had a lot of my students who are mediums. So uh, when we could talk to this entity and they know Kabbalah and we could talk a lot about, I have learned a lot from the point of view of the spirits. Have you paid, have you paid any attention to what David Heimsmith is doing with Kabbalah? No, I don't, I'm not familiar with yeah. his work. Yeah, I'll have to share some of his but, uh, stuff. You should check yeah. out. Check out my interview with David Heimsmith and check out his work. Um, All right. It's very, very, uh, I mean, you could call it cutting edge. Uh, what it is, is he's resuscitating views that he learned from oral teachers of his in New York, but that are representative more, I believe, of the Eun school and the Gates of Light. He has a new translation, brand new translation of the Gates of Light coming out. And his books are amazing. They cost a fucking fortune, but they're, they're well worth it. Um, yeah, I think you'll be very, very impressed with what he's doing. Basically, uh, he has a non-emanationist approach to Kabbalah, which is really nice because um, my background was more Abalafian. But essentially, as a as a human thinking being, I have often had uh, I've had a fascination with, but a problem with emanationism, and I've written about that in my in my my works, like the Ethics of Understanding God. Um, the the problem of uh, of the idea of the the um... <laughs> sorry man my uh, my mushrooms are kicking in pretty hard right now that I ate at the beginning it's of the okay. podcast <laughs> it's like you're glowing off the screen you're glowing off the screen because wow. I ate so many mushrooms in part <laughs> it's but, great um, so yeah. I go to Canada my my cousin lives in Montreal. You're, the, so, I will meet you as soon as the pandemic is over oh dude we'll yeah that's what i'm saying you're, you're telling me to come to brazil and i'm like we're so like we're yeah. so locked down but i i really hope things change because there's like yeah i've the amount of invitations to places to speak and give classes and workshops and and stuff it's crazy let's not talk about <laughs> our careers all imploding though over the last uh, 16 months let's not focus on that too much it's been such a pleasure talking with you. I'll uh, I'll show you kill the hippies next time. I'll show you my card games and board games Great. next time. We we'll, can do more on that. Um, but All I right. And, and next time bed. your listeners will be here with us. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> let's. I'll start inviting my exclusive subscribers to be live on the thing, which should be fun. That should be fun because I've got some cool guests coming up. Oh, Great. Marcelo. Yeah, let's call Thank it a day since it's almost three so a.m. for you. Yeah. Three a.m. Yeah, brother. You're a superstar. Right. I love you. And see you. Uh, until next, see you next time. See you next time. All right. Let's, how do I, okay, wait, wait. All oh, right. Yeah, I just do this.